before I start talking about my experiences on this dose or that dose and that sort of thing, I want to sort of preface these statements uh, with this statement. Do not try this at home. We are trained professionals. You're going to hear some very, very good things about DMT. But I must caution you that DMT is a very, very powerful substance. And my original reasons for getting into the DMT study is that I wanted to protect people are still valid. These things have the potential of doing powerful, powerful things to the human being. Notice I said powerful things. I didn't necessarily stress positively powerful things. Hi, and welcome to The Seeker and The Skeptic. I'm Kat, and I'm the flaky, unpredictable, maybe a bit irrational Seeker. And I'm Rebecca. I'll be your sarcastic, grumpy, close-minded, skeptical host. Or maybe we should just be ourselves. Sounds good to me. This podcast is going to dive deep into the controversial topics that some may call New Age, or woo-woo, or just plain foolish. And hopefully look at them with a sceptical but open-minded approach that will encourage understanding and acceptance from both the sceptics and the seekers. This episode, we're going to talk about psychedelic spiritual experiences. Mother Ayahuasca willing. Indeed. We're back from a trip to Amsterdam where ayahuasca is maybe legal. And just like all psychonauts, we're very keen to tell you about our trips. Psychonauts? You know, people who take drugs to explore consciousness. It's millennial speak for hippie. Okay, (laughs) well, first, we should probably explain what ayahuasca is. That's a good idea. So ayahuasca goes by a lot of names. Yahe, the mother, the grandmother. La Perja, the vine of the soul, and so on. And I've got this quote from Dr. Gabor Mate, um, who's basically a Canadian physician and an expert on addiction and trauma. Ayahuasca is not a drug in the Western sense, something that you take to get rid of something. Properly used, it opens up parts of yourself that you usually have no access to. The parts of the brain that hold emotional memories come together with those parts that modulate insight and awareness so you see past experiences in a new way. So basically, an, an ayahuasca ceremony involves drinking the plant or vine. Um, it's kind of like a tea blend. So you get these plants and a vine. Um, and That's you... the capi vine, right? Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll get onto the plants in a sec. Okay. But yeah. And, and you sort of boil them up um, over many hours. Um, and you do this... Uh, historically or traditionally under the guidance of a shaman otherwise known as a curandero or ayahuasquero and so for um they usually last about four hours um but like that's how long one shot might last you uh but a full night with multiple drinks is much more common and the aim of these traditionally is to form a deeper connection to a higher intelligence and furthering your own understanding of your true self. And it basically induces a psychedelic experience, which can be traumatic, joyful, healing, and usually all of the above. So yeah, the the drink itself is this tea made from the capai vine, I'm not really sure how to say that. And it's cooked with um, a plant such as chacruna or uh, huambisa, um, or a mixture of both. So these are... um, and it's important to get the this combination right because the ayahuasca vine alone won't cause you to trip balls. Uh, the ayahuasca <laughs> itself just serves the purpose of deactivating this enzyme um, called monoamine uh, oxidase or MAO, which occurs naturally in our stomach. And so once that is um, deactivated, the alkaloid dimethyltryptamine or DMT can pass into our system. Um, it goes through the blood-brain barrier, and that's the stuff that gives us the hallucinations and all the other things. So and te- people take DMT just on its own as well, don't they? It's been synthesized out of that thing. Exactly. And technically, you can make ayahuasca from, uh, yeah, just like extracting the DMT from lots of different plants. Um, 
and even synthesizing DMT without plants, and you can blend that with Syrian rue seeds to act as the beta carbolines found in the ayahuasca vine. So there are lots of ways to make ayahuasca, um, but uh, but a lot of people who you know are really proponents of the original blends are quite skeptical about this approach. You know, it's like this idea that you can't just make the medicine. Um, you know, it kind of miss- misses the magic of the the actual plant mixture. It's also probably something about the idea that people have that natural things are good. Exactly, like that's a classic sort of bias that we humans have. And if it if they think this is the natural way to do it, then they're always going to think that's the better way to do it. Yeah, it's like um, eating the whole plant instead of the ground down flower or whatever. Um, and yeah, historically, you know, these tribes. Um, mostly in uh, South America, they have been using this brew for centuries, if not millennia, um, and have been kind of working with plants uh, and not just ayahuasca and chacruna and stuff, um, working with the spirits of the plants. They they believe all of these different plants in the rainforest um, have a spirit and they all have kind of like different personalities. Um, you can use them to communicate with the dead, uh, with God or the creator, um, to travel to different dimensions and just generally get information um, and use it for healing. Yeah, because this is part of a, a bigger culture where lots of different hallucinogenic um, plants are used, isn't it? It's not just, they don't just have this one ayahuasca. They use all sorts of things. It's, it's been part of their culture for a long time. Yes. But I read this interesting study um, It's by a guy called Brabak de Mori, uh, Tracing Hallucinations is the title. It was published in 2011. And he said that he suspects, and he has, um, you know, I I was convinced anyway what he said, that um, ayahuasca hasn't actually been around for that long. No way. He he starts off by saying that it's always assumed that... um, primitive i'm putting air quotes around that people have always lived the way they do since the stone age Mm. but obviously their cultures and technologies evolve just like our do ours do and he reckons that um the tucano people who i think it's colombia that sort of area probably discovered or invented because it's as you say a mixture of two plants about 300 years ago and prior to that they would have had other psychedelic plants that they were experimenting with but there's no evidence of ayahuasca being used more than 300 years ago yes so it's yeah fair enough um And it's not unique to that country. All over the world, people are using and have been using plants. Um, You know, Europeans have been using mushrooms for at least centuries, right? Yeah, and we actually have evidence of, um, you know, like cave paintings in Europe of people taking uh, what we think are what we would now call psilocybin or magic mushrooms from a long time ago. And pre-Columbian glyphs as well in South America of that. And peyote as well. There's evidence of that in, of a cave in Texas they found that was like 5,000 years ago. But ayahuasca itself, actually, we have no evidence of being used more than 300 years ago. Hmm. And it's, it's interesting because it's like, it's again, it's another bias we have where we think, traditional things are good yeah and so therefore if you want to sell ayahuasca to someone saying it's traditional is good and also um this guy was saying in this paper that uh anthropologists say that creation myths are they refer to the present they don't it's not like our western conception of history where we're like you know this happened in the past and this how it was it's more like a story that they tell to cement group identity and to sort of give something to gather around they don't necessarily nap actually believe that's where it came from so there's lots of creation myths and stories about where ayahuasca came from but that doesn't mean that it is actually ancient these are just like folk tales almost and that's how a lot of people especially people who are not selling ayahuasca conceive of those stories in south america like people we have this weird selection bias where we only talk to the people who are selling the ayahuasca and they tell us about how ancient it is but this guy spoke to lots of people who weren't involved in the trade and they were like no this isn't ancient this is this is relatively new for our culture yeah yeah and i think it's it's part of this um kind of myth of it being um ancient that is making it popular today so you've got that mixed with these different celebrities like sting lindsay lohan you know because they're (laughs) the same um and and another like media influencers like joe rogan and tim ferris talking about this substance so we've kind of got like seal of approval from them um in addition like it, it feels a bit different than what was happening in i don't know like in the 60s like this wasn't this isn't coming from a lab um so yeah we're, we're hearing that you know we're like 
uh, honoring these ancient traditions in this like um at least in the western world we're kind of thinking oh how there's a novelty in being part of something that feels really old and real um, yeah and it's, it's it's not that similar to like LSD and stuff that was happening in the 60s, but it is really similar to how people talk about um, mushrooms or how people did talk about sure. mushrooms. Sure, yeah, that uh, also, yeah. Because, I mean, they are actually ancient and um, they're like people used to talk about communicating with the spirit of the mushroom and there was all sorts of things. And the same with um, peyote as well. In fact, peyote is referred to as the medicine, just mm. like ayahuasca is. And people thought they had a go at trying to cure alcoholism with it, which is what people are trying to do, like Gabo Mate yeah, is trying yeah. to do with. So this idea of a, a psychedelic, what are they called? Entheo- uh, well, entheogens, entheogens. It's, yeah. that's more to do with like uh, giving you a perception, like a spiritual experience. I think that's why they think that it could cure addiction and things, though. That something about the spiritual experience is vital. But anyway, the idea of entheogens, which uh, which can transform consciousness, is is not new. But maybe ayahuasca is. But who knows, really? Yeah. Um, it's interesting that we don't have any history of of the use, though. Yeah. So oh, based- I do have a good origin myth, though. I oh, please if you tell me. Hear yeah, it. Yeah, I've well. done so much reading, and one of the books I read was uh, the Ayahuasca Reader, which is brilliant. It's a collection of essays about ayahuasca, and I'd recommend if you want to get a grasp of the literature surrounding ayahuasca it's a really good read and a lot of it is um there's a lot of poetry there's some artwork in there as well so it's a real mix um but one of the cool things they have is some origin myths and this one's from um a tribal elder of some sort called mentague it's just first name just mentague transcribed by a guy called jonathan miller and he said long long ago when the sky was still close to the earth and the stars glistened just above the treetops this is how the first miabu vine was born and that's what their culture calls that in their language they call ayahuasca miabu it's got so many different names so people go up this big tree which is because the sky is closer to the ground in those days they go up into the tree which goes up into the clouds to get birds um to catch birds uh, but one guy gets stuck uh, everyone else comes down safely, but this guy, one guy's stuck and there's a shaman at the bottom and he's like, oh no, I'm stuck. What am I going to do? So this same shaman summons the rainbow serpent and he says, just slide down the serpent's back. You'll be fine. So he slides down and he's back on earth. He's like, hooray. And uh, the shaman says, what you've got to do now is cut off the tip of the serpent's tail. And the guy's like, why? But he does it anyway because he's a shaman. And he c- cuts off the tip of the vine and the snake slithers back into the sky. And from the blood that lands on the ground from that cut, that's where the first vine grows. Hmm. So the guy's like, oh, that's interesting. Strange little vine. Goes back to check on it later, a couple of days later. And the guy said, after a few days, the man returned. The plant was growing well with several clusters of fresh lime green growth. And there, to his amazement, was a small jaguar the size of a mouse. (laughs) He saw the mouse jaguar, but it ran quickly into the forest. Bewildered by this tiny jaguar he had never seen before, he left comes back a couple of days later and there's more jaguars of increasing size there's one the size of a house cat there's one the size of a deer they're just getting bigger and bigger and he thinks to himself is the plant attracting the jaguars or are they coming out of the plant and then his second thought obviously is wait a minute if it attracts jaguars will it attract women I don't make this up. This is in the book. So he distracts the jaguars, grabs the leaves and put them like rubs them on himself like perfume. And then he goes to a big festival thinking I'm going to get some ladies. And he gets what he wishes for. He gets mobbed by women. He describes them grabbing at his private parts and he makes a narrow escape. He's like, they're just all over him like this. Uh, And so the moral of the story is you have to respect the plant and be careful what you wish for. That is wonderful. Um, I think we should just end the episode there, really. I mean, that just <laughs> explains everything we need to know. <laughs> but it's quite good like, to see like, what the origin stories are like and yes. to see how they are symbolic. And we don't think that the people who's, who repeat these stories actually believe that's what happened. They, they're telling a story, which, yeah. is, which is really weird and cool story, but it's not necessarily representative of history. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, I mean... It, Basically, you know, when you take ayahuasca, I've heard three things can happen to you. You can either die, go crazy, or you can learn something. Which makes me think that maybe it's time to play the recording we made a day after our ayahuasca experience and, um, you know, find out what happened to us. And then afterwards, we'll be back with some research, psychology, science and the history of ayahuasca. So what were your expectations before taking ayahuasca? I mean, how much did you know about it? 
What did you think was going to happen? It was really hard to know what to expect because everyone has such different reports yeah. of the experiences. I'd heard a lot about the Clockwork Elves, so I was looking forward to seeing them. I looked on, um, we'll talk about the Clockwork Elves later if you haven't heard of them already, but um, I looked up Google Image search of them to see what they might look like. And then I was worried that I was priming myself too much and that I'd end up seeing something. It's like cheating. Exactly. Um, I was scared of being sick because I don't like being sick. Mm -hmm. I mean, who does? And I heard that almost everyone is sick, if not everyone is sick. And everyone kept saying, whenever I'd say I'm worried that I might be sick, they'd be like, no, 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 it's fine. It's good. It's part of it. And I was like, (laughs) I don't think I'm ever going to get to that. (laughs) That, that Yeah, yeah. The other thing I was a bit scared of was going insane. Mm, Naturally, because you do hear stories about that as well. Yeah, not necessarily with ayahuasca, but generally you meet people who've had drug experiences and it's changed them profoundly Mm -hmm. in a way that, at least from my perspective, did not seem entirely good. (laughs) That's interesting. So like there's a particularly, there's a particular version of sanity that you would deem as acceptable. And when you hear about other people's version of reality, you know that you don't want that, basically. Yeah, I like being able to make judgments and discern. I mean, that's kind of what it is to be a sceptic, right? Sure. Be able to make discernments based on evidence. And I don't want the part of my brain that's good at doing that and about putting things together logically to stop being able to do that. That sure. was quite frightening. Yeah, fair enough. And uh, the other thing I had, someone had mentioned when I told everyone we were going to Amsterdam to do ayahuasca, um... Most people said, "Uh, what's ayahuasca? But um, a couple of people said that it it, it helped them with depression or anxiety. Yes. So I had that sort of vaguely in the back of my mind, like actually because I suffer from anxiety um, and occasionally with depression, I flirt with depression, but anxiety is my main thing. I thought maybe, maybe this will help me. But the most reassuring thing was knowing that you'd already done it. Mm. So I was like, well, Kat seems exactly the same as she was before. Well, not exactly the same because we all (laughs) change, but... there's nothing fundamentally broken about her yeah, yeah, yeah. that wasn't broken before. Well, so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm glad that there was some reassurance <laughs> there. Um, and I guess, yeah, I'll speak to how I felt about doing ayahuasca this time. Yeah. Uh, because, so I have had an experience with ayahuasca um, about a year ago, actually. It was exactly one year since I went to Peru. I figured I would just go straight into the heart of it, uh, where it's you know, most popular to to do it, um, which is a place called Iquitos. Um, And I actually had a really, overall, very, very good experience. Um, Not particularly strong. Like, my, what I'd heard before going there was, uh, you know, you're going to be transported to another dimension. Mm. You know, you're not going to be able to tell what's what. Oh, and it's going to last for, like, eight hours. And uh, so that all sounded very intense, and I've never had, like, a real hallucinogenic experience before so I really was looking forward to the visions both then and now and you're just jumping into it and you're going to do in Peru you did like three nights in a row well yeah three nights but with a day in between so they gave us a day of recovery um and my main kind of overall experience at that time was how nice it was to be in a circle of people going through not exactly the same experience but we're all kind of Mm. going through it together whereas there are some drugs like and actually, by the way, you're not really meant to call ayahuasca a drug, you know, it's a medicine. But <laughs> a let's, call it, let's call it a drug for the time being. Um, but things like mushrooms, I feel like y- you you wouldn't necessarily want to do them alone. But the group experience, I don't think is maybe as important. Mm. For me, anyway, my impression from that time in Peru was one of the biggest things here is that you are in a group and that you're sharing this and you're feeling safe. And um, I, that that was quite profound for me. Um, other things like the physical sensation of, you know, your body feels poisoned, so you need to be sick and all of this stuff. I actually was sick maybe once in Peru and it took me, um, there was a lot of work I had to do to get to that point because it just wasn't affecting me in that way. Um, so I figured this time around, maybe it will be the same. I might just get off (laughs) scot-free and not have to purge and, and, you know, have a really kind of easy time of it. Yeah, knowing that you hadn't been sick that much the first time you did it made me feel a bit better because I was like, oh, maybe I'll be lucky and won't be sick. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, that was not the case. (laughs) Spoiler alert. Um, But yeah, this time around, I hadn't really been thinking about it too much. I certainly wasn't really concerned because, again, it's not like going to the rainforest. It's going to Amsterdam. It's a city. Um, Going with a friend. So again, like less, maybe more self-conscious, but less scared 
Uh, so yeah, that was- that's weird though because I think there were, maybe it was just because we like when we both thought each other had done more research than we had. <laughs> um, because I, I we arrived in Amsterdam the day before you me yeah. and my partner arrived the day before cap and i he asked me oh no what time do you have to get there and what's this and what's all these details and i was like, oh, i don't know cat will know all that stuff and then cat arrives and she doesn't know any of that stuff no, either. I've, been, I've spent the last like two weeks on a farm i don't know what's what <laughs> um which was good it was actually reassuring to know that both reassuring and disconcerting that that neither of us had done the research but we dug through our email and found the address of the place and the time that we were supposed to be there, which was 11 a.m. to start at 12, yeah. and a phone number for the guy called Bass. That's I think that's all we had. We didn't even have a surname, did we? Just Bass. Nothing. And and no, like, real communication with him since, I guess, we wired him the money via Western Union. <laughs> and we all know how secure and safe Western Union is. I actually did a bank transfer. He but... did? Oh, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. I struggled with that. We anyway. found this place on a website called iamundo.com. Yeah. Uh, which is... A bizarre thing that this even exists but it's like a review site for different places you can go do ayahuasca which yeah. just shows what a big deal it's becoming and it seemed quite legit yeah 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 for sure i mean this place it has got lots of reviews are very good reviews um and yeah i mean the communication with baz had been friendly so i wasn't yeah. really bothered that it but then was... it just completely dropped off we got yes. the confirmation email and then i was maybe expecting like another email saying oh don't eat this beforehand yeah. and maybe you'd like what what to wear wear comfy clothes bring a pillow like all that sort of advice but we just got nothing complete email which silence is, uh, what i've what i've seen is is very rare because lots of um if you look for ayahuasca retreats in the amazon you will see like whole pages dedicated to the diet or the dieta that you're meant to do before and after Oh, yeah, because you told me you're not supposed to eat all sorts of things. Like you're not supposed to have all coffee. All sorts of things. Or... Yeah, it's coffee, marijuana. You're not meant to have sex. You're not meant to eat salt. You're not meant to... Um, meat products are out. I think you can eat eggs and fish. But, like, a whole load of rules. <laughs> and I was actually... I wasn't super strict about it, but I took it seriously enough when I was in... Um, uh, Iquitos, and I think a lot of other people, you know, they'd ask you, you haven't had any coffee today, have you? <laughs> it's very important. Uh, and this idea that marijuana and um, ayahuasca, you know, these plants, they don't necessarily get along. It's almost like there are two different spirits. Yeah. Say. And marijuana is supposed to stay around in your body for quite a long time, isn't it? That's how they can do tests yeah. quite a long time after you've smoked and show that you've been smoking. Right. So, because we're in Amsterdam, obviously, we went to a coffee shop and got high the day before. Obviously. <laughs> obviously. And um, of course I ate, drank coffee. Yeah. At 20 minutes? <laughs> but hang on. Why was I drinking coffee? Oh, right. Yeah. So we text the guy the day before. We text Bass and say, hey, uh, you know, what time should we arrive? What time should we expect to leave? Because we we want to let people know where we'll be and, you know, do all that stuff you're supposed to do to be safe. And just complete no, no reply at all. Mm-hmm. So we text him the next morning with a similar sort of inquiry. No reply at all. So we hop in an Uber and drive to the address on the email and it's an industrial estate in the middle on the outskirts of Amsterdam, middle of nowhere. Really, uh, and we get to the door. Um, it has a number, but nothing else. No doorbell, no knocker. Um, no one's around apart from a guy in a garage. Yeah, the, in the industrial estate, each unit is used for a different business, and the business next door or beneath, perhaps where we're supposed to be, is looks like a mechanics. Yeah, and he sort of wanders out. You know, like like what do you want? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, no. And Kat says, I think we're looking for Baz. He's like, oh yeah, Baz. And that was it. That's and he just got. turns around and walks back behind the cars yeah, and yeah. disappears into his unit. And now it's starting to drizzle. So we figured, you saw a coffee shop, a yeah, cafe as, actually. So as we drove, shop. as we drove in, yeah, that would be terrible. I'm like, oh well, <laughs> just go get high. Yeah. Um, as we drove in, I noticed a, a little cafe or something. Um, so it was... We've been told to arrive at 11 o'clock on the email to start at 12. It was 11. Yeah. Uh, we texted him. We said, it's 11. We're here. Still no reply. So we thought, we'll go to the cafe, sit down and figure out what we're going to do. Yeah. And when we got to the cafe, we started saying, oh, you know, it won't be the end of the world if this is just a scam. We can write a bad review. It's only money. Yeah. And we're starting to think about what we might do with the rest of the day if he yeah. never turns up. I had um, totally signed it off. I was like, this isn't going to happen. I'm going to have this coffee. Yeah, maybe we wander back and see. But really, I was thinking, this is done. Let's just order the Uber now. 
and then we were just you were just finishing your coffee I didn't have coffee I just had water but only because I'd already had a coffee that morning and I can only have one a day or I get a bit jittery um, <laughs> which might make you wonder is it wise to do drugs <laughs> but <laughs> anyway um, so we decide we're going to wander back and have one last look to see if anyone's arrived or if anything's doing at this venue and when Kat said it's a it's a blank it's completely blank there's no sign saying Baz's ayahuasca retreat mm. or there's nothing to indicate that we're even in the right place yeah, so that's yeah. another thought I was kind of thinking oh maybe this is like his business address but he actually does the retreat somewhere else and there's been some kind of mix up and we've gone to like the place like where he's billed yeah, or yeah. like it could be anything so we stand up to go and have one last look and that's when we get a text from him saying um are you let me actually get, I can probably find it <laughs> No, I can't find it. Sorry. Um, yeah, he just said, you know, are you still there? Did you find it? And I was like, yeah, yeah, we found it. Um, but how do we get in? Yeah. Uh, and then he, I don't think he did reply to that, but we did go over and maybe we knocked. Yeah, I think we knocked. And that's when the woman with the glasses. Yeah. Marguerite. Yeah. Oh, the, um, just she opened the door and she's suddenly right there and hugging us. But that was just a timing thing because there were stairs. I don't know how she heard us. Yeah, I guess it was just an timing. accident that she happened to be down or maybe she went down to unlock the door or maybe Baz texts her saying hey there are going to be some girls arriving anyway yeah. we don't know she finally found us and another woman followed behind oh, us oh Kat said something scary when we were in the cafe Kat said I said oh but won't there be other people arriving and you <laughs> said um, well maybe it's just us I, I really like, thought it just us and the mysterious Baz <laughs> I do not like this plan I, I just expected there to be other people there so when the other woman followed us in I was like oh thank goodness we're not the only people here. I was kind of disappointed. I, I, I really, for some reason, wanted to really, at this point, really wanted an intimate setting, but uh, kind of glad that it wasn't just that because, yeah, you, you wouldn't, you'd probably go mad if it was just one other person. <laughs> so we go up these incredibly steep steps. Yeah. Um, and now we're in the top layer of the, uh, I guess it must be above the mechanic shop. Yes. And suddenly we're in like a very pleasant room with lots of uh, 10 little mattresses on the floor. They've taken um, a sort of bare industrial estate room with those um, panelled ceilings that like pop out. Yeah. And they've put like carpets down and they've hung lanterns and put tea lights everywhere. There are elephant heads on the wall. I mean, not real ones, but like, you know, decorative things. Yeah, lots it's of nice. elephant themed things and um, lovely soft blankets and soft furnishings. And it has a very like, it's kind of um, makeshift hippie cozy yeah. it, it doesn't feel like you know it's been like here forever or that we're in the midst of the amazon it's just cute yeah just cute. but we can't stay in that room we're ushered into a room with a big pile of chairs the holding pen yeah <laughs> whilst they finish getting everything ready in that nice room and in in the holding pen <laughs> with all the pile of chairs and very little space to stand up and a big pile of people's belongings in the corner um are like nine other people yeah the other participants i guess um so everyone was, well, everyone was speaking English and maybe four of them were maybe English. We had an Irish guy, a French girl who was living in Amsterdam. Uh, Australian, Dutch. Uh, I think that was everyone. I think yeah. most people were from the UK, actually. It's hard to tell because everyone spoke such good English. Such good English, yeah. but maybe, you know, everyone was having a different accent. And the age range, well, most were probably in their 20s, really. Yeah. And then maybe there was an older guy. Um, he must have been in his 40s. Older woman. Yeah. 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 Oh, I didn't notice the older woman. Uh, the Dutch woman. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was really quite nervous at this point. You seem to be more edgy than normal yeah i just went it qu completely quiet i was like i can't talk to these people i can't talk to anyone i can't believe i'm here for some reason and i think it's because i've been doing a bit of traveling with a lot of people just recently i felt quite at home with this particular group because you could tell and we had hints the kind of people this this was it's kind of like it's not quite like full-on spiritual hippie let's say let's say that that's a category um these are people who are open just like super open i would say that they're all seekers, they're seekers yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh one of the guys said something he said w everyone was obviously saying oh why did you come why did you come what yes. was your um how you did know? you know about ayahuasca exactly and one of the guys was like oh well i heard like some people that i really respect and listen to talk about it and i was like and my ears perked up to see who he'd reference and he was like you know sam harris tim ferris yeah, yeah. And i was like i can't remember sam harris ever talking about ayahuasca but right. <laughs> but you can tell from that like the kind of he's listening to podcasts a lot of these podcasts are talking about these experiences and um 
again, it's a world that I think we're both really familiar with. Yeah. Uh, so again, this this is the kind of thing that comes. It's like, oh, these me. are my people. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, I was a bit prejudiced, to be honest. I was expecting these people to just be like, I don't know, crawled out of the the depths of some kind of, you know, hippie <laughs> haze. And they wouldn't even know what a podcast was, and their shoes would be made out of old bread bags. And but they seem perfectly then normal. Then you realise we're one of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Wait a minute, my shoes are bread bags. <laughs> and I think uh, the Dutch woman p- uh, pulled out a deck of tarot cards, and I get excited because I'm like, <laughs> we were just talking about tarot cards, and the um, northern girl says. Oh, typical, you know, synchronicity. And I'm like, right, right. <laughs> and looking at Rebecca, and Rebecca's like, <laughs> just no, blank no, stare. No. <laughs> but then, yeah, so we had a little play with the tarot cards. Um, that was fun. And then they ushered us into the other room so that the, I think about four people could smoke DMT quietly. Yes. And that was interesting because we were just talking on our little mattresses in the corner. Um, there are two rows, which I didn't like so much because what I love about my previous experience was this idea of being in a circle. Uh, not sure why, it just seems important to be in a circle and it wasn't quite... Like yeah, that. it was a room, it was a... Um, a long room. A long room with two rows facing each other. Um, and because we... Everyone else who'd been there had also been there the night before, the mm. day before, to do a ceremony. So we were coming in for our one and only ceremony because we're yeah. only there for the day. Um, and they'd all sort of chosen their mattresses or yeah. whatever so we had the ones that were left um which were sort of in a corner i was right in the corner which is perfect yeah a little bit outside of the group in a way yeah um but anyway I, we were talking and i could see behind you the people like tripping out on dmt just like lying back on the sofa thinking oh my god i'm kind of <laughs> glad i'm not doing dmt right now <laughs> yeah that was weird what were they smoking with the, could you see were they just smoking smoky or with a vapor i, I couldn't see i could just see the result of one guy who was just lying with his head back, you know, eyes closed. That's another thing. Before a, a month or so before we we did this, well, before we went to Amsterdam, I smoked DMT just so that I'd have the comparison mm. of the things I do for you, podcast listeners. <laughs> Taking one for the team. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I was really disappointed. I we watched um, too many cooks, which if anyone. <laughs> has heard this or seen this will know it was a very bad idea but we thought that's trippy enough it's an internet meme it's a video give it a google it's horrifying um anyway so we thought we'd watch that and smoke dmt it's not supposed to last long so it'll be about the length of video um and basically my experience was i felt a little bit sick and everything went sort of swirly at the corners but i didn't have any, yeah, it was really like everyone makes such a big fuss about DMT, and I don't know whether we didn't have enough or we put it with the wrong thing mm. or what. But that same smell of the changa, which yeah. is the herb that you sprinkle the DMT on to smoke, came wafting through from under the it's door. It's pretty gross. It's disgusting. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine if you had one experience with it, you don't want to smell that thing again. No. So after that, Marguerite came and sat down on you know one of our little mattresses and kind of gave us a very brief. 101. Yeah, I don't know whether we got a sort of potted version because she'd already been through it yesterday with everyone. But I will say about that, like Dreamglade, if you arrived after anyone else, you still got the full whack. It seems quite important to let people know what they're in for. And I mean, when I was, sorry, I know I will keep comparing it to my last experience, (laughs) but I think it's relevant. But, you know, I really got a good, you know, it felt like half an hour, maybe sit down and it really reassured me and it would reassure anyone to have this level of, uh, um, a walkthrough about the whole experience uh, and and I think she gave it a go but it was you know five seven minutes yeah and as we said we didn't have any we didn't know how long this was going to last we didn't know so we were questions. unsure about whether we were staying the night or not yeah and we decided just to not bring our stuff to stay over and then we would just run away if yeah. they said we had to sleep then also, I was like, <laughs> like I was I mean eight hours is sort of like at a push I, I had heard you know, more like four to six hours mm. to the full effect. But really, I mean, we'll get to how long it lasted. But um, <laughs> So she said, first, we're going to set our intentions. Then we're going to have a, um, a, a the first drink yeah. thing, which is... An MAO inhibitor. Yeah. So so with traditionally with ayahuasca, I, I'm not totally sure if I'll get this right <laughs> this time around, but uh, ayahuasca is a root. Um, that's the stuff that obviously contains the dmt but you want to take the a leaf of another plant and there are lots of plants that do this but um in dreamblade i took a shakruna and maybe there was another plant and i want to say 
Wambisa or something, that that was mixed together. And that's the thing that stops your liver um, producing MAO, which, which is, is monoamine oxidase. And that's the thing that would normally block the DMT getting into our bloodstream. So combined, these two things let the DMT go in. Uh, we did them separately, though. So the first drink we had, which was this little, uh, you know, light brown, almost beige a shot glass color. of beige yeah, it was a liquid. Good, it was a good 50 mils. Um, um, and that's the MAO inhibitor. She wouldn't tell us what mixture this was. She wouldn't Whereas, tell us anything about anything. No. So, so not even any mention of the plants, which is weird because in the Amazon, I think talking about the plants is a big deal. You're, you really are. That's a big part of the experience is talking about the plants themselves. Like maybe because we don't have... Well, there weren't any plants in the room. We, they didn't have that vibe of like... No, not at all. That vibe. No, oh, you're in no. a... In a freaking... My brain has broken. <laughs> <laughs> but you're in an industrial estate. In yeah. a, you know, it's not... So it's getting into... So she gives us a brief spill. She says, you're going to take the MAO inhibitor. Then you're going to take the ayahuasca itself. 15 minutes later. 15 minutes later. Then you're going to trip out. And then four hours... Two hours? Two hours. She was vague. Um, You're going to take another cup. And it's important that you take the second cup because we want to all be going on this journey together. Yeah. Um, But don't feel like you have to. But But it is important that you do. Yeah. And then, um, and then we're, and then you'll have your second, the second half of the trip, and then um, we'll bring you back round, and we'll give you something to eat, and then you'll go out, and then you'll go out. But I didn't know what she meant by go out, and I think she meant. I think she meant we'll go out. Me and Justin will go out because that's what happened. Yeah, that is what happens. But I kind of thought that means we all leave or we all sleep. I mean, it's it's a, the strangest two words. Really? For, and yeah. you asked, what do you mean? Yeah. And she didn't really clarify. No, she just said, well, you know, you'll go out. <laughs> <laughs> and we haven't introduced Justin. Just Justin came in um, at some point during all oh, this. Justin. And immediately, like, but because it was a small space, he's a, he's a lovely, handsome man in his 20s. Um, Australian? Yeah, very friendly. Um, just immediately hugs me and yeah. says, I'm Justin. I'm like, I don't know what that means. Yeah. That's just a word. To, like, I haven't been told there'll be oh, a Justin, Justin. coming. I'm I don't back. know anything. Like, just suddenly this guy is hugging me and saying, I'm Justin. I'm like, oh, I'm Rebecca. And he's like, great, great, great. And he hugs you and does the same thing. And then someone says, oh, what happened to your hand, Justin? And he's... Um, he he's like oh i broke it or what happened to your arm and he says yeah. i broke it and then it turns out it's his hand he's broken and he says i broke it in two places and they're like oh my god how do you know and he's like well i went to the doctor and they said i've broken it in two places and they're like oh well should you really be here should you be doing this we don't even really know what he's doing mm-hmm. someone says how will you play the piano i'm like the piano and <laughs> there's all this going on and he says well you know it's just broken what can you do and one of the other guys says well you could go to a hospital <laughs> and everyone laughs, <laughs> And that's that, really. Yeah, that was that. Um, and it turns out Justin is one of the organisers. So it's him yeah. and Marguerite who are... The facilitators. Facilitators, yeah. Um, Baz is in, in no... No, yeah. Never mentioned. Not mentioned. We don't even know who he is. He's just a mysterious email slash text voice. Yeah. So, so we were all sat on our mattresses. We're given the MAO inhibitor. Yeah. Oh, we have to set our intentions first. No, no, no. We do that after. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, we did that before ayahuasca. So we drank that first and immediately everyone lies down, which a dream blade, you're told, especially for the first 20 minutes, not to lie down. First of all, because you're more likely to be sick if you lie down straight mm. away. And secondly, because you kind of want to stay as present as you can for the experience. Just like in meditation, the ideal is that you're kind of sat upright. Yeah. Anyway, so that was weird. And I went by dream glade rules yeah. with my loyalty. And so I think, yeah, Kat sat up and I sat up too because I was like, well, I'm going to copy her. We were also given a grape or we t- t- take multiple grapes to kind of take away the taste, which again would have been like a no-no at dream glade. You can't have any food or drink anything beforehand for a good like hour. We had tea, like lovely mint tea and ate yeah. grapes. Uh, this is so poorly explained though because when they were offering the grape round, I literally didn't know what was being... No. But I was just seeing a little bowl because it's dark. It's all candle lit. You can't see what's going on. You see people being given the shot glass and a small... Round thing. I thought it was going to be a chocolate raisin. Yeah, I was worried that it was going to be a chocolate yeah, raisin. I was like, am I going to have to say no? I can't have this because I'm vegan. But thankfully it was a grape, so everything was fine. But yeah, that was helpful. It was definitely bitter, quite a thin liquid. It really wasn't as bad as I expected. I think people overhyped how bad it would be. It was vile, but... I will just say that it was very different to what I've drunk before. Um, I also think I have a tolerance for bad taste. Bad taste. That's yeah, cool. I'm not super sensitive to that sort of thing. Yeah. So we sit there for the 15 minutes and they're playing like the sounds of the ocean. 
Yes, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't maybe some chanting yeah. on the on the playlist. Um, and then we go to, to the centre of the room. Yes. Yeah. So that's that is the one real ritualistic thing, the only thing we really did. And Magritte said, you know, you can say it out loud, and I was like, that's very personal. Or you can keep it to yourself, and obviously everyone keeps it to themselves. Yeah, I was hoping that people would say it out loud. I did want to know. Because of the podcast. It would have been. <laughs> Sorry, guys, we didn't get catch any intentions. Um, but you know, you light a candle each, and that's. Nice. Yeah, and then put them in the centre. Do you want to talk about your intention? Yeah, so my intention, because I'm spending this year travelling, uh, I asked the mother <laughs> what my what my real purpose was doing, like, this year. Like, you know, what am I trying to get out from this travel? Because my ego has an idea, but I wanted to see what she had to say. When she says she or the mother, <laughs> she was referring to Mother Ayahuasca, naturally. The spirit, yeah. The <laughs> Keep spirit up, listeners. <laughs> Oh, we should say, we're recording this, maybe we'll say this in the intro, but we're recording this quite... Just two days. Yeah, just two days afterwards, and our brains are still a little bit addled. Even my my belly is still, so... Yeah, I, like, I was thinking that to too. and to the toilet at some point. Talking about this experience is making me remember what it felt like, yeah. so that's not good. Um, so I set my intention. My intention was something like... I was thinking, obviously, because we're doing this for the podcast, so I was thinking about the podcast, and about all the experiences we've had so far, and about how... I'm finding value in some of these things mm. and obviously I'm quite critical of some of these things and but there, there is something there's something there and I want to know what that is and if if any it's it was kind of vague but I, the kind of the way I put it in my head at that time was is there anything left if I take away the supernatural mm. if I take away that doesn't have anything that doesn't have an evidence base or if I take away all those things from these spiritual practices is there anything that will fulfill me and be useful to me yeah almost like have something to enjoy and like what would that be yeah so that was kind of my intention it was a bit vague but that's what I wanted yeah and thinking about it that's probably my intention going into all of these experiences it's the podcast yeah intention for you. um so then once we we're given the little purple drink so this is what i'm more familiar with this is what ayahuasca looks like it's kind of like it, it looks like wine really yeah um it was a lot thinner than dream glades mixture um it didn't have that kind of sweet plummy taste to it it's just kind of vile and i stuffed two grapes down my mouth straight away and i didn't really taste it it has a that. really chalky aftertaste very chalky and mm. there was a like a residue left in the bottom of my cup after yeah. i drank it and i was like when i gave the empty cup back i sort of showed justin like oh there's some stuff left in there because i thought maybe that is the important <laughs> stuff and it's all settled to the bottom and it's he, like a tea i mean yeah. you don't have to drink the tea leaves to get the full effect okay yeah, good yeah, yeah. um uh yeah well again it wasn't as bad as i was expecting um there was some like people were really hamming it up like people were holding their nose whilst they drank it and stuff i think okay so here's the other thing i which i mentioned to you uh once you've had it once it does seem to get worse mm. like the, did you find well, did you find the second time you drank it worse? Not really, no. Interesting. But I was really out of it, yeah. as we will discuss. <laughs> so then we went back to our mattresses, and again, everyone's getting onto their covers as if they're going to bed. And I think we, we are the only ones, and maybe one other girl, who stays sitting up. Yeah, I decided that I'm going to stay sitting up until I'm sick. Yeah. And then I'll lie down. Because um, I don't, like, no one wants to be sick lying down. And also I wanted no. to be able to grab, we should say, there were these, um, there were these white bowls. Plastic bowls. Next yeah. to each of our beds. I can see your face lighting up whenever you <laughs> think of the white bowl. I'll talk about the bowl later. <laughs> um, yeah, so you, the idea is that, you know, you just grab that whenever you need to be sick. Um, and one of the facilitators will also come and, like, take you to the toilet if you want to go there. That was nice. Actually, Dreamblade didn't really emphasise that. But I really felt like there will always be a facilitator to look after me in any case yeah i did worry though because some people had said that the purgings can sometimes be sick but it can sometimes be diarrhea and i was like i don't Ooh. want justin to take me to the toilet because they said if you if you need to go to the toilet then one of us will take you and we'll leave the door ajar yeah. so that we can make sure you're safe in case you fall or anything which is very sensible but then i was just imagining myself having a horrible like puke like coming stuff coming out of both ends justin yeah. watching yeah not good yeah handsome nice australian justin with his broken hand how's he gonna help me with his broken hand anyway <laughs> You can barely move it. Anyway, yes. <laughs> um, but what I also will say is that combined, the inhibitor and the ayahuasca would have been maybe 100 mils um, in all. So that's actually a really massive drink yeah. compared to, again, what I've had before. What I've had before was maybe 50 mils on the first drink. Actually, maybe even 25 if, you, wow. if you're a first timer. Yeah. So anyway, I was kind of like aware that, oh, definitely had a lot to drink but as you, uh, when we were talking to marguerite and kat said oh what's in it because she knows the names of the plants and she was like is it this plant is it that plant what's going on and marguerite was just oh i don't know i don't make it i'm just very proud of it 
Yeah. It has great effects. Yeah. We think it's brilliant. It's so like, we had literally no idea what the content of these shot glasses yeah. we were drinking. And at that point, something in my brain was like, oh, this is actually like probably a really bad idea. <laughs> Not a good way to start a trip. Okay. <laughs> not, to, not to know at all what's in the thing. I, I trusted that it would be some kind of plant mixture, but just kind of annoyed that they would want to keep it proprietary. Like, mm. That just it seems to be a bit like out of the spirit. Well, I kept thinking like if they're good business people, then they won't want to get bad reviews on sure. Ayamondo. So they're probably not going to poison us. Well, they are going to poison us, but they're not probably not going to kill us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so very quickly, so another thing about ayahuasca is you don't want to be sick within the first, you know, 15, 20 minutes because it's still doing its work. So you're meant to try and hold it down as much yeah. as you can. Don't drink any water in that time. We weren't told any of this, but <laughs> I knew it. Um, but there was a guy who within about five minutes was puking. Yeah, really, really quickly. And yeah. really gross sounding. <laughs> well, pu- it's hard to puke not sounding gross. At Dreamblade. Everyone seemed to manage it. Wow, really? But it might have been because we were further apart. We were spaced further apart and it's a bigger space. Mm. But in this room, vomit, vomiting just sounded like the worst thing. So we're, we're sitting there in the dark and you're hearing, with our eyes closed, or at least I had my eyes closed, and you hear the first guy puke and like, whoa, that's a bit soon. And the, uh, Justin or Marguerite's walking around wafting like incense over us and spraying us with a... Palo Santo, and they, the spray is that stuff I showed you, Florida water, Agua de Florida. Yeah, it's like a perfume lovely. water. And I was like, oh my God, she's going to spray me in the eye. Because ah, she's just gotten in one of those plant misters. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, you'd spray cats or something. Yeah. It seems a bit strange. Um, <laughs> but it smells nice and it's probably good to cover up the smell of vomit. It's better than the tr- traditional thing where a shaman takes it in their mouth, uh, like swigs it and like uh, spits it at you. Yes. A little bit better yeah, than that. Definitely prefer that. And it just suddenly, we, suddenly, slowly we start hearing people start to be sick yeah. around us. One man, the second man who was sick was very quiet. And I was like, oh, I hope when yeah, I'm sick, I'm nice and quiet that like was that. Actually, he was quite um, a flight sicker. <laughs> Uh, they're still playing sea sounds and I'm feeling like the sound of the sea is making me feel nauseous and oh. it feels like the the mattress is like rocking like I'm in a boat okay um but I'm also thinking I don't want to because I know quite often I start to feel and I was feeling a bit sick that morning anyway sure. probably partly from the anxiety of yeah. going to this thing so I was like I don't want to like grab my bowl because then they'll rush over to see if I'm okay and then I won't be sick because I'm just... So I'm like trying to yeah. decide when's the right time to pick up my bowl. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a logical thing to think. I wasn't feeling sick at all. But my first, you know, feeling of it was it went into my hands. Like my whole body was kind of... Um, it's like a very mild vibration. Uh, and I, my hands kind of went a bit numb. It was pleasant. Like, so mm. I was like that for maybe two hours. Wow. Just a nice kind of buzz. Um, and my brain was kind of starting to processed thoughts a little bit differently like it was harder to keep on a linear chain of thought so you know you're there for eight hours you're listening to music but the only thing to do is be with your thoughts and your feelings and uh I decided fuck that I'm gonna start like planning my travel <laughs> things and like think hey okay, what what can I do like how can I and as soon as I tried to do any kind of linear planning um the thoughts would kind of go away I, I kept coming up with the phrase oh thoughts are like a slippery fish and I had that thought maybe 20 times in wow there. yeah yeah I, w- I was really wishing that there was a clock because I wanted to know how long yeah. I'd been sitting there feeling slightly nauseous and then and then I felt like oh actually maybe I am going to be sick so I grabbed my white bowl and I put it up on my lap and Marguerite came round and I sort of started retching and I was like, oh, I'm not going to be sick and now yeah. she's come over she's gone to all this trouble and I'm not going to be sick I'm just feeling like uh, but then um, she started pressing uh, she got like two fingers and pressed them really hard in different points down my spine Yeah. Um, like I don't know maybe they're like meridians yeah they're some, maybe they're significant somehow but that was and then she was like stroking me and whispering Dutch words in my ear oh how funny I, I had no idea what that was and that worked that did the trick um, <laughs> I, that made me feel really sick <laughs> yeah feel, it's, and you want to be sick because once you have that feeling you know when you're feeling sick even yeah. if you're not taking any kind of poison or drugs being sick makes you feel better so I wanted to be sick and I was and luckily we hadn't had a big breakfast because again yeah. we had no warnings no. about what to eat or what not to eat because it wasn't too gross and almost immediately after I was sick she took the bowl away and gave me a new white one. and I wanted a tissue to blow my nose yeah. as you do after you've been sick and she was like oh a tissue and then she went off like tissue should be something she should have to hand like it's fairly obvious people are going to want to have tissues um anyway she came back with a kitchen roll and gave me a bit of that and I blew my nose um and then I lay down and I started 
actually thinking, oh, this is happening now, yeah. something's happening It now. does feel like that. As soon as you're sick the first time, I think it really takes off. Oh, and the, the feeling of my body moving around was much more dramatic yes, after that. And, oh, oh, yeah, I forgot to say, when the, the first time I started being sick, that's when the, the crying started. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, the saddest thing in the world. <laughs> so I um I was being sick and I like um I had I was holding my hands on the bowl we should probably put in like a warning for people who don't want to hear about people being sick a lot at the beginning yeah maybe. make a note to do that <laughs> <laughs> so we're holding the bowl I'm holding the bowl and I hold it with my hands and I have my thumbs like poking up yeah. and I just put my thumbs on my temples oh. because I can't hold my head up because wow. yeah. and 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 then I'm just like this is I don't think I was even having any thoughts. My face just started screwing up and my diaphragm started pushing up inside of me and I just started sobbing. It oh, wasn't like... so interesting. It was just like... That's like a purgy kind of sob. That's not even about thoughts. That Yeah, no, it completely... There was no wow. thoughts. I had I had thoughts later, but in that moment, I was just crying and crying and crying and she, and she said, good, good, wow. good, good. Let it out, let it out. Um, and I could hear... She took away the sick bowl and then I just had the bowl and I could hear my tears dropping, like plopping Aww. into the bowl and running down my nose. Um, and then the, like that wave of sobbing passed. So I went to lie down and tried to cry quietly. <laughs> oh, it's so sad. By the way, listen, I wish I had a recording of this so I could play <laughs> the saddest sounding cry in the world. I don't know why it was so sad. It really was the pit of despair. It was horrible. <laughs> yeah. Um... Yeah, so this was sort of like an interesting part of my experience is just you're kind of integrating everything that you're hearing as well. So at this point, my experience might have started getting mildly visual, but it wasn't really. It was more just um, listening to the music, which I noticed kind of alternated between a quite intense song, like let's say it's kind of like some tribal drumming and chanting, and then this really like, almost like, I describe it as Enya music. It's that mm. kind of like, very beautiful women speak singing. <laughs> um, and I noticed that, you know, when I've had like a kind of rough wave and I am starting to feel a bit like sick or distressed in some way, um, that would ease as soon as the music eased, let's say. Yeah. And then I could hear Rebecca and I was wondering if I could kind of um, project my astral body into hers and go like, try to understand like, what, what, what are you going through? Like, what is the sadness and how can I help? I did a lot of that, Aww. actually. So with you and maybe a couple of the other people who I could hear, like, being sick, I felt very, like, uh, like wanting to help yeah. in a way that, by the way, I never normally want to help <laughs> people in, in such an extreme way. Um, and I've noticed this in my previous um, experiences that it is very heart-opening. Like, I felt like a big um, loving feeling, which you don't kind of normally walk around with, feeling yeah. like this intense love and consideration for other people so that's kind of like a nice thing it would be nice to kind of take that with me in theory it's very very rare to see people that vulnerable well, that's around true. you right completely it's a weird experience to have that so i think the natural response is obviously to want to help but like with other drugs i don't think with other drugs you are if you're tripping out you're probably not that concerned about other people whereas for me i also get because of the this heart opening quality of it I care a lot in those moments. There was one woman who was, she was very, very loud when she yeah. was being sick, which was really upsetting because it made everyone feel, I'm sure it it's made everyone feel sick. sick yeah. And she was sort of, and, but then when she wasn't being sick, she was groaning, groaning and crying like an, and saying, animal. oh fuck, oh shit, oh, yeah. oh. And she's like, all the time. And because of, also because of the sound of the waves and the kind of feeling of movement that I was experiencing, like we're on a boat, I was like, it sounds like she's like down in the galleys, yeah. like rowing this boat and she's like being tortured. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Went to this museum in South Africa years ago and they had um, like an exhibit about uh, slavery sure. and they had this um, thing, it was like a dark room and like stuff flashed up on the walls and, and it was supposed to evoke the feeling of being, being in the hull right. of a ship and all the slaves um, wow. rowing around you and how horrific that was. And that's yeah. all I could think as I heard this woman groaning in yeah. the sound of the sea and it's just like, Oh yeah, really, really horrible. That probably didn't help with the sadness. No. Well, and yeah, and that's when um, Marguerite came over to me because I was still crying. Oh uh, no, I think this is like the second. I can't remember how many times I was sick or purged. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, that's right. Um, it, Justin came around the second time I picked up my bowl, yeah. um, and I was sick a bit more, and I was crying, 
and he asked me how I was feeling yeah. and I just looked up at him and the only word I could say was sad <laughs> I remember this and he was just like good good good, good. Yeah, yeah. I was it's like it's not good, good. <laughs> um, and quite soon after this we were finally asked I mean time is passing very slowly for me but we were asked you know it's time for another drink um who wants one how are you feeling and I pretty much knew I don't think I do want one I'm I don't know like I, I guess I, if, if I'm honest I was just feeling like scared I don't want to be being sick what I'm feeling now which is definitely physical is enough for me you hadn't had any visions at this not point. any real visions I would say that things were maybe starting but you know I wouldn't close my eyes and see something dramatic it, it was just like this is like the very, very beginning stages. And maybe my body is feeling like um, a bit fuzzy and maybe I'm feeling a little bit queasy, but it's just very yeah. hard. But still enough for me to be like, oh, I don't know if I want to go down this route. You yeah, know? yeah. That's exactly how I was feeling too. But not, I was, um, because I was so sad and I knew that the um, the ayahuasca had made the sadness. Yeah. Or, well, I don't know if I knew that. I. It was very strange. So at first, the first sort of thoughts are going through my head is like the absurdity of us human beings yeah. Like you said the same thing. Like we're yeah. there here and we're poisoning ourselves. Yes, very silly. And I started to think about just the absurdity of humanity full stop. And yeah. because the slavery was in my head because of the groaning and the and the sea. And I was thinking about like, you know, all these or matter and um this is this is like yeah. typical, this is what people say when they do drugs. So excuse me, please, listeners. But this is what I was thinking. I was thinking like the universe is just matter and it's all physical matter moving around. And then something happens and some, you know, something interacts with something else. And suddenly, for some reason, there's some consciousness that exists. And then it, we like eventually at the end of this long story, there are humans and we're conscious and consciousness is a mistake and it's driven us insane. And that's why the world is so mad. And that's why we have slavery. And that's why we're all suffering and why everything is dark. And that's where the sadness comes from. And to be unconscious would be nothing and therefore i mean it wouldn't be happy but at least it wouldn't be this just this right the suffering the sadness yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah like this is all coming and i just kept on thinking you know try and think of good things try and think of good things sure. and justin came over i was being sick and i was like justin he's a good thing and then i thought but justin will die and, oh. I, won't, and I won't even know because <laughs> i'm not going to keep in contact with justin <laughs> this is very it's only funny for me right now thinking about it because it reminds me of one of my like uh, looping thoughts that I had, you have many thoughts, but really they're all looping. I get a lot of repetitive thoughts, especially with ayahuasca. And one of them was any thought that I would think I would make it positive. So if everything you're saying now, I would have taken any one of those trains of thoughts and turned it into a positive thing. Wow. But I think I'm doing that normally anyway. But the fact with ayahuasca is that there's this other thing that is then judging that thought. Mm. So I would constantly be saying to myself, why do you have to turn everything into a positive spin? Like, why can't you just be with the thoughts? What, what is this need to turn everything around? Yeah. Um, so I was kind of berating myself a little bit for that and then thinking, oh, but that's not such a bad thing. We all do this. And maybe it's a good thing that I turn my thoughts into positive <laughs> things. So this is my beginning of madness, which is with ayahuasca. Uh, and I had it in Dreamblade as well. Just being aware of the thoughts that repeat themselves. Yeah. And of course, not every thought is a repetitive one. Because let's say something happens. There's a new song that comes on. Well, that's a new experience. But there were certain ideas that I'd come back to. And which is happening in real life all the time. But with ayahuasca, it really disturbs me. And that's what, for me, madness feels like. Wow. And wow. I realized that... And I think this, this is even maybe before um, the second drink, but it kind of flavoured the whole trip was that concept of this is a drug that really is letting you see the limits of your mind. And that is terrifying and is one flavour of madness and one um, way that ayahuasca maybe drives people insane. Yeah, I got quite frightened at this point. I couldn't stop crying. I was being sick at regular intervals. I felt in just incredibly sad and everything that I kept on trying to I was everything I kept on trying to generate to make sense or to make meaning or to think how am I going to talk about this on the podcast right. or just to get myself everything just felt like 
Um, and I wasn't really seeing things, but I was having these very intense thoughts that were kind of semi-visual. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Like everything would come up like a, uh, like on a stage, like pieces of cardboard. Okay. And then it would just fall down. Yeah. So it'd be like, this can comfort you. Oh, like I was thinking, oh, try and think of happy moments from your yes. past. And it would just fall down and everything was falling. This is quite a common thing with ayahuasca. I've heard stuff like that before to do with the stage or seeing everything and it. it's actually plastic or cardboard. Yeah. Or I did that, but only with, um, if a vision looked disturbing in any way, I would remember the one piece of advice that you're often given is if it scares you, go move towards it, like mm. surrender to it. And so I would say, okay, I'm going to look at that thing. I'm going to let it happen. But as soon as you, I did that, it would always twist into like something fake oh. and you could tell that it was fake yeah. and almost funny. So another thing that people say is I also has a sense of humor and, um, I wouldn't laugh out loud, but I would sometimes kind of smile to myself being like, <laughs> Oh, you did it again, you sly one. Um, yeah. I felt like, like all the all the stuff, all the the patterns and connections. I was seeing the truth of them and that they were meaningless. And everything underneath everything mm. was just this profound sadness. And literally everything that humans ever try to do is just to escape that sadness wow. and then we're all just on a like on a lake of it like we're on a little canoe yeah floating on a lake and we're like i'm having this moment of awareness that the sadness is there yeah. and i don't know if i'm ever going to be able to get back out and that's when i started wow. thinking oh my god you know like i i do have i do suffer with mental illness i mean i'm not like you know i don't have serious problems but you yeah. know i'm not the most together person as it is and was this even a wise idea and am i just going to be sad forever now oh. And then, yeah, and then I was like, well, this sadness itself is just happening in my brain. It's something my brain's creating. Yeah. And it's something that's created through the interaction of the drug. So this itself yes. is a hallucination. Yes. And then, I'm like, but aren't all emotions hallucinations? Everything's a hallucination. And then, and then it's time for the second cup. Ah. And I hear Kat saying no. no. Yeah, actually, I said no quite, like, quickly um I was like oh, I just yeah I don't want a second cup I don't want another cup and then my great came around again it was almost like we had this first round of asking how everyone was doing and the second time she came up to me and I, you know my eyes are closed and she like kind of surprised me um and she kind of stares at me with her big like owl eyes like so you know how are you doing you want another drink and I'm like no she's like why and I'm like I had to really like look her in the eye sternly because I know myself, I know that I could easily fold to this, but I also don't like being pressured into something, um, especially with ayahuasca. Similar to in Dreamblade, we were strongly encouraged to purge. And if you weren't purging, it was almost like you were doing it wrong. Mm. And I really don't like that feeling. Similar to this, I knew that if I didn't want another drink, yeah, I would try to stick to that. So I was like, I just don't think it's right for me today. You said that really quite clearly and loudly. Yeah. I remember hearing it. Yeah, because I was scared. Like, I was, and I, I was scared of taking more and I was scared of, um, yeah, doing it without wanting to. Uh, so I didn't. I got away scot free. <laughs> and when she came around to me, well, when when she came around to me, I was, Justin was tending to me because I was having another of my um, purges. No, in fact, she said, she said, it's time for the second cup. Everyone sit up. And as soon as I sat up, my tum stomach uh, shifted and I started being Yeah, you sick were again. being sick and everyone else was, well, a lot of other people were drinking. And I remember thinking, is Rebecca going to drink? No, surely not. And then, so she came round and she was like, I was being sick. So they put the shot glass down next to me and said, when you're ready, here's your second cup. And I yeah. was like, fantastic. I'm just not going to drink it. <laughs> <laughs> that, because now they've left it there so it's up to sure. me whether I drink it or not so I've got a great excuse because I was having this I mean I just described what I was going through I didn't want more <laughs> of that thank you very much um, so then I was being sick being sick crying crying Justin doing the same thing pressing the different points on my back to make me cry more or make me sick more and then that eventually ends and I go to lie down and he's like you forgot this and he's got the second cup and I'm like oh no 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 and he's like Yes, 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 yes. I can't remember what I know, said. No, it's true. It's true. It, it was like, um, I couldn't really hear properly, but it was definitely like encouraging. It was not just encouraging. It was forcefully forceful. <laughs> yeah. It really felt like he, it was important that I drank. And I'd heard Kat say no. So in a way I was encouraged by that because I was like, she successfully no. said no. So I can say no. But then I also heard another man say no, yeah. maybe the older guy. And then, no, I think it might have even been the Irish one. Oh, but really? he did end up saying yes. Right. Yeah. And so I thought, 
oh no, that's not good. If there's three of us not drinking, that would be really like, so there was like, I don't know. I just felt this massive social pressure. pressure of course. Huge of course. social pressure. I think pressure. everyone did. And he sort of put, forced it into my hand. So I was holding it. I was like, no. Crazy. And then he was just looking at me and I felt like he's not going to go away unless I drink this. Oh, and I was God. like, oh. And I, of course you're in a vulnerable state right now. You're sitting in a bed. Like you've just been sick. Like you're sobbing. It's such a crazy thing to expect somebody to have any willpower left yeah. in that situation. That's what I felt. I just felt empty. And I'd had this realization shortly before this that I was full, that I'd had enough. And I wrote mm. down in my, I was ch- taking notes the whole time. And I wrote down, I've had enough. Yeah. No more things. I decided I was never going to eat again. <laughs> I was never going to drink again. I was never going to read any more books, any new books. I was just going to read books I'd already read. Films the same. Like I just, I was like too many experiences. I haven't processed everything that I've gone through yet. I just mm. need to be left alone. And, and go through all this before anything new comes in. That is kind of like saying, it's almost like saying like, like I'm ready to die. Yeah. Right? It's like saying, I don't want any, any new experiences. I'm done. That's how I felt. Yeah. I felt wow. like I wanted to lose consciousness like quite yeah. profoundly. Wow. And yeah. And anyway, and then so he's, I've got the cup in my hand and I'm kneeling up now on the bed and I've put the bowl to one side and I'm just like, I just want him to go away and stop yeah. looking at me. So I drink it. And he like... Lights up. He, yeah, it was amazing. He yeah. was so proud of me. And I really felt it like he radiating. He said, warrior. Yeah. And, I was, and it was so sad because I lay down thinking, I'm not a warrior. Kat's the warrior. She's the one who resisted the social pressure no. and didn't do it. Do you know how I was feeling? I was feeling like gutted that um, I didn't get that positive reinforcement from <laughs> someone. I was like... Oh, fuck, I've disappointed them. Well, you get it from me now, because that is brave <laughs> to resist, to say no I in that situation. I thought it was brave to, to drink in that situation. Um, I think it reminded me of um, when I was a kid, my brother broke his arm at school, and um, they took me out of school. We were both in the, primary school, we in the same school, to like support him or whatever, because they couldn't contact our parents. And um, so we're in the hospital, and he was having his arm set. And they said, do you want to wait in the waiting room or do you want to come in yeah. and have his arm set? And I said, I want to come in yeah. to be with him. And they said, oh, that's very brave. And I was like, you think it's brave, but it's yeah. not brave. I don't want to be alone sure. in the waiting room because yeah, 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 that's yeah. what's scary to me. So it's so like thinking like all it's this stuff, yeah. what we, when we think someone's being brave yeah. from the outside, we don't actually know what's going on. Yeah, what's the bigger fear that they're dealing with? Yeah, right. it could just... And I felt, I felt very, very weak and ashamed of myself for not wow. standing up to them. It was, yeah. It's... And this is what's weird about the experience of ayahuasca because you're not, you're definitely not encouraged to speak to anyone and you kind of almost don't feel like you could speak to anyone. Yeah. But even though you're in this big room and I like being with, I think it's important that you are with other people because it, it feels very lonely anyway. And it's very disturbing to be alone with your thoughts in this way. Yeah. When your thoughts are kind of like playing tricks on you, giving you these extreme emotions that you don't know where they're coming from. Because I could have just, if I was... In my right mind, I could have just reached out to you and said, yeah. I don't want to drink. Can you tell them I don't want to drink? Exactly. And we and I could I would love to have said to you, you know, how are you doing? Are you okay? Like all of yeah. that stuff, but you don't feel like you, you physically can. It's it's um, very, very weird. Uh so after that, I think about fifteen minutes after that, because Magritte says, Oh, if you change your mind, you've got about ten or fifteen minutes. I'm like, Yeah, fuck you. Um, <laughs> but also thinking, Oh shit, maybe this is wearing off. Because another thing about ayahuasca is that it kind of comes and goes in waves. And maybe I was having a particularly like gentle wave at this point. Maybe there was a nice song on. And I was thinking, oh, am I going to regret this? But then, but then it kind of started getting interesting. And I started having quite amazing visions at this point. Stuff like just beautiful things. Like um, I was in this kind of like strange spacecraft and I was able to see the galaxy. And it was kind wow. of like what I think it was like lucid dreaming in a way. Because I was fully conscious and aware of, you know, you, you still have some part of your brain that's kind of um, with you. And, you know, I was thinking, wow, this is going in a good direction. Like, what if I can, you know, make more stars? And like, how would I make this even more beautiful and kind of like turn up? Wow. Um, And it is really beautiful in the same way that it's closer to that, the hypnagogic state when you're falling asleep or waking up where everything looks better than you can imagine. Like if I just close my eyes now and try to imagine a star, like the stars, it's, like very vague it's really just looking at a black blank canvas but this is you're really you really are seeing things so um, it's like looking at a screen more or, so yeah yeah and yeah. yeah. um, a lot of people talk that it's even it's really like a screen and it's almost like you're only seeing a, a box like you're watching a tv oh. but i didn't have that this was pretty all over and another repeating vision that i have and had before in my previous experience was uh it's kind of like looking at 
you know, the scales of a snake, but it's like a very, very long spiral. So you kind of, you could kind of travel along. Inside? Yeah, it's almost like, yeah, it's kind of like more like a tunnel, a tunnel of um, like scales and repeating geometric shapes. That's so interesting because in the um, in the episode about uh, holotropic breathing, yeah. we talked about those, um, I can't remember what they're called, the forms the tun- that we see and the yeah. tunnels that we see and the way that that's constructed from the way our brains work and the yeah. way our eyes work. Yeah. So that'll be something to look and, into. And, and I got very into that and I was thinking, oh shit, I'm actually travelling along, my consciousness is travelling along the neural pathways of my brain. Wow. I'm seeing the inner workings of my brain. And that was cool, but also a little bit scary because again, I'm, I'm sort of worried about the safety of my brain at this point. Um, and this is, you know, I haven't taken a second drink. Have you been sick yet? No, which is crazy. And then the visions are sort of peaking at this point and they're really getting in there with the music and I'm also dealing with whatever thoughts and, um, coming to a lot of like ideas about my body. Cause I'm feeling very much like a poisoned animal. And I, when I say animal, like it really is like a beast. You don't feel like a human anymore. I felt like we're all animals here and but animals with these like insane minds that can create these beautiful pictures um, and have these complex ideas. So then I, and I, I kind of kept thinking I was seeing like a, a woman's face and I was like, ah, that's her, that's the mother, that's ayahuasca, which is, you know, I was kind of like going full down <laughs> the, uh, the loopy train. Um, and this one, this particular vision of the mother was like very, very red. So I could kind of see this woman, almost like a classic, like Madonna figure. Um, and it kind of took over my whole visual field. So there's other stuff going around and those kind of like the snaky scales and the tunnels are kind of happening as well. And I was like, wow, I'm really going into this. Like here she is, everything's red. It's quite intense. And she handed me Uh, Yeah, I was kind of like riding the snakes kind of towards to meet her. And then when I got to her, she kind of gives me this like amazing red wand. Um, And I was like, ah, right, it's up to me now to take it. Do I take it? Do I take it? I was like, yeah, I'm going to take it. So I grab it and I'm like, oh, what do I do with it? Uh, And I kind of like plunged it into my belly, almost like, um, you know, like kind of stabbing yourself. And everything, all the red stuff kind of surged at me. So rather than going forwards, it's all kind of coming into me then. And I was like, whoa, this is really intense because it feels very full on now. And then I'm kind of like, and this is it. And now I probably need to be sick. Yep, probably <laughs> this is it. Um, get my bucket and th- where, where so are So you're seeing all this with your eyes closed? Uh, eyes closed. Then you feel sick. You open, open your eyes, eyes and, and I just I see the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So luckily, because not everyone has that fortune, they open their eyes and they can still see the stuff. But I'm still pretty much there. But uh, that was it. And it was, it's... Like I said, it's kind of like, it was quite gentle. It didn't feel like um, the feeling of feeling sick wasn't that intense. It was just like, my body was like, boom, you're done. It wasn't like I had to retch very much. Yeah. Um, You said I did sound like a retching cat, but... Yeah, yeah, she sounded super cute. The (laughs) cutest vomit I've ever heard. Very high pitched. (laughs) And Marguerite came to look after me and she didn't press multiple places. She only went for the, the base... Chakra. Okay, mm. sorry. <laughs> like the, the the bottom part of my spine, like my tailbone, and it's just pressing that. And that was interesting to me because I was thinking, oh, I just seen the color red. She, does she know that this is like to do with my um that root chakra? How did you feel about her when she was like tending? I to felt you? generally good, but not amazing. I didn't feel as close to her as I did with say one of the facilitators at Dreamglade. Mm. I felt like ah, oh, she thinks she knows what she's doing. Um, but also whenever she was very close to me and rubbing my back or pressing my back, I couldn't be sick. So as soon as she like backed off, that's when I could purge. So I was kind of like, you know, you're not necessarily helping me right now. Um, but I'm glad you're here. Yeah. I kind of, I was thinking that they're not really people when they were around me. Interesting. I don't know exactly what I was thinking they were, but I think it's because we hadn't had any interaction. I didn't know these people. They had like... Almost like doctors in that sense. Sorry, doctors in the audience, but it's that kind of feeling where you're just being looked after and you're so vulnerable. Impersonal. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Especially Justin, because Marguerite had sat down and talked us through it, but all I'd had from him was a hug. Yeah. So I... I didn't know this guy. He was anyone. He was just pressure on my back. Yeah, I was really wondering. I wanted to ask you, how were you feeling about that presence? Because at least with Marguerite, I mean, personally, I was like, oh, good. She's like just like a gentle mother figure. But this young guy, do I like trust him to know what he's doing? It was just a bit of like, for me, a respect thing. Yeah. Um, but I think 
what it sounds like because at the time you don't care as long as it's no. like there was one part where I was like in child's position which is sort oh, yeah, of curled up yeah. and I knew that he was touching my back and he was in front of me and I was like is my head in his crotch I don't know <laughs> if my head's in his crotch and yeah. I, there's no way to tell no so I'm just gonna stay here until he goes away it's this is a weird thing about for me with the ayahuasca thing um like all of those things for me it's like the sexuality of everyone is kind of stripped away um, I remember when I was at Dreamglade and you're called up to the, uh, to the curanderos, the shamans who are singing the whole time. So it was a bit sad for me not to have this, like two people singing. Yeah. We just had, um, whatever, an MP3 player. Uh, and one of the guys, when you went up to him, he would place his hands on your head and you wouldn't, I w- my eyes were always close. So you weren't really sure how close your head was to his crotch. <laughs> um, and that position is again, quite a vulnerable, potentially sexual position. But it felt all very stripped away because you're with, like, this shaman creature who doesn't seem to be quite human. It's almost like a spirit. But I think I'd got to the point then where almost, like, no one was really... And this is, like, I've been thinking about how things weren't real and how everything was meaningless and it was all just a sham. Yeah. And then I started berating myself for drinking the second cup. And then I was like, who is this yourself you're berating? That's not real either. And the same process that had happened with all the ideas I'd had before started to happen about the ideas I had myself and they started to go into paper and I started to see behind and then it was just white 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 and yeah and I think that's oh I I did have a a little bit of visions of like because my visions I interpreted them to be uh like the patterns that uh, we make up the nonsense we I kept thinking this is all nonsense it's nonsense (laughs) all the connections between things Mm. and I would um see like uh it's hard to describe, but like tendrils coming out of things. So yeah, tendrils are a big yeah, thing. and they'd all connect to each other. And I'd be like, of course, I'm making them to connect. We all make things connect, but nothing connects. Nothing is connected. <laughs> oh, Everything is I'm meaningless. So but we have we we imagine all these all these pictures, and, and I close my eyes and I just saw you know like you know typical psychedelic yeah swirly swirly swirls. Sure. And then um, I was purging again. I don't know how many times I purged. I would say like five or six. Yeah, yeah and I, I'm being sick, and it's usually. That starts the sobbing, the proper yeah. stop it, sobbing off, because I'm just trying to weep quietly most of the time. But then once I'm sick, I just can't stop, and I start crying, 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 crying into the bowl, tears falling into the bowl, just horrid. Um, and that's when I started seeing that the bowl mm. and the whiteness of the bowl, this plastic tub, was is the meaningless void, and yeah. I'm staring into it, wow. and I'm crying into it. Wow. And the irony of crying because I'm mourning everything that I'm losing because yeah. everything is falling away, but everything that's falling away is meaningless. Right. Just like the whiteness of the bowl. Yeah. So th- the crying is meaningless. Yes. The sorrow is meaningless. Everything is meaningless. It's all just the bowl. Yeah. And the bowl is, as I'm holding it, I'm like hunched over it and I'm holding it sort of, I, I don't know, it almost like I was actually had this thought in my head. It's like I'm pregnant. It's like yeah. I'm holding my pregnant stomach, but my pregnant stomach is just like a the big bowl. empty bowl. And that is the lack. That when, yeah. when I was thinking about my intention at the beginning about what is there left for me, right. if I give up all the spiritual stuff, if I give up anything that doesn't have any evidence base behind it, what is left for me, what can fulfill yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing can fulfill me. Yeah. I am the bowl. Yeah. I am empty like the bowl. And, and, and it's almost like by definition, it's empty. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And then... I was like, I know what the answer is. What makes us human is consciousness and consciousness is meaningless and it's all just a horrible trick. But we all have the empty bowl. Yeah. And that is what we need to worship. That's what we need to honour, the emptiness inside of it. And when we see people doing all the crazy shit they do, whether that's, you know, all the stuff that we investigate in the show or whether it's falling in love or whether it's war or whether it's slavery, all this thing just comes from a profound emptiness that is the core of humanity. Right. And if we could all just stand up and show each other the bowls. Oh, wow. And say, this is it. We are just the bowl, the bowl. And nothing is going to be fixed because there is no fixing. This is like these little narratives we make that you can't put anything into the bowl that has more meaning than anything else. Exactly. And so all we can do is empty ourselves into the bowl and realize that we are the bowl. Yeah. And, that's when Marguerite came and she was like, um, she was saying something in Dutch and I just said, I really like this bowl. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. And I remember you saying something like, yeah, like I, I, you, I you know, gotten quite close to it. I yeah, like, yeah, I said I've become quite fond of it. <laughs> it's 
So well, that's great. Rebecca's managing to crack jokes right now. I guess she can't be too feeling too bad. Little did I know. Um, no, so this is interesting. So it's almost like the bowl is what connects us all in that sense. We all share this this mutual um, hole uh, that we're trying to fill. Yeah. And the, okay. and once you realise that the bowl is there, every, and this is what I was thinking about, um, my friend who had said that he'd heard it helped with anxiety. Yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm anxious. My anxiety isn't anxiety, it's sadness. Yeah. The sadness comes from realising everything's empty. Yeah. But because everything's empty, the sadness is meaningless. It's like a, yes. a, a yeah, brain yeah. trick you can do to get yourself totally. out of... So yes. anxiety reduces down to sadness. Sadness is stupid because everything is meaningless. Yeah, Solved. yeah, of course, of course. And it's like, see, these are the, the, the realisations that people have. I wouldn't say that they're super profound or something that you didn't already know mm. it's what ayahuasca seems to do is help you feel those things um deeply um so for example i had a lot of stereotypical realizations so you know my my intention was to find out what am i doing on this this year what's my purpose mission this year and the answer was basically um everything you're doing I, oh my i literally got the opposite message it was like everything you're doing is meaningful it all has a purpose <laughs> And, um, you know, you can't get it wrong. So anything you do, I could do anything this year. I could travel anywhere. It's all equally meaningful. Like, but, but yeah. it's the same message. It is it's the like, same message. It's all equal. It yeah. doesn't make a difference. Anything you do, it's just, it is what it is. No, no one thing is better than any yeah. one other thing. Ah, what? but it's just a different spin of the same thing. Yeah. Like, that's not bad. <laughs> but anyway, the trip bloody just keeps going. I was getting just like, I mean, you said at one point I would pay, you know, you said I'd pay a thousand pounds to be home in bed right now, and mine was like, I'd pay a thousand pounds just for it to stop. Yeah, it's annoying because my big fear I mean, your profound emotion that was uh, going on it was sadness, but mine was mostly fear um, fear of losing my mind and just wondering, I just want to feel normal again. Yeah, because it's long. And that's when he started playing um, your favourite song on the oh. piano. Justin, no, with no, no, his broken sorry. hand. He, played my, he did not play my favourite song. <laughs> he played Imagine by John Lennon, which I don't like. I think it's patronising. I quite like it. Um, I never really thought about it that deeply. But, but when, pro- when I did think about it deeply when he started and the first lyrics, you know, Imagine There's No Countries. I'm like, oh my God, that's, that's true. What you're thinking. There are yeah, no countries. Yeah, yeah. Isn't hard to do. Also <laughs> true. If you're tripping on ayahuasca. <laughs> Nothing to kill or die for. Also yeah. true. No religion too. Also true. And I was like, and that's when I started saying sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was like, yeah. these things, like everything that popped into my head, um, it was like, sex is meaningless. Plants, meaningless. Yeah. Such and such, meaningless. Relationships, meaningless. Mm-hmm. Like again and again, meaningless, mm-hmm. meaningless, meaningless. And every time I made one of those realizations, I just said to myself, sure, 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 sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's meaningless too. Sure. Sure. I was just like whispering this to myself like a, a, a I, maniac. I thought you were doing like a soothing thing that a lot of um, shamans do, which is like this sounds like there's a lot of like sounds. And I th- thought you were doing that, but no. But actually uh, the only thing that didn't um, just disappear or evaporate was I was thinking of my partner, Paul, back in the Airbnb and mm-hmm. wanting to be back with him and thinking at the end of all this, he will, still he's important. there yeah, like yeah. in this little glowing um like I'm imagining the Airbnb apartment like floating in space, just yeah. glowing, and he's he's there. I'm like, I just have to get through this and then get back to the Airbnb apartment, yeah. and then I'm gonna lie on the sofa and he can pet me like a cat, <laughs> and everything will be fine. Like, yeah, he's the one thing that didn't turn to paper and go yeah. away. Wow. Even though like big concepts like relationships were going away, right. and obviously that's what I have with him. I have yeah. a relationship, but something about his presence yes. was still there, which is insanely comforting. But then I also thought, um. Maybe that's what's keeping me from turning off. Right. Fuck. That's what's keeping me in this meaningless world. Like keeping me pretending everything's real. Yeah, sure. Because that's where he lives. It's like an anchor. Oh, yeah. So it's kind of like, I was thinking how, what would this experience be like if I didn't have him in my life? Sure. And that that made me think, and maybe this is something we can talk about in the second half of the show once we've got our shit together, (laughs) um, about like whether it's a good idea to do these things, especially if you're in a vulnerable mental state or if you're alone or if you're very sad that you're alone or this yeah. will be another long section um, <laughs> but yeah the other song that Justin played with his broken hand keep in mind he was playing but he had a sling by now he did, he did manage to get himself a sling from somewhere oh, yeah he just disappeared um, <laughs> we were going in and out and when we opened our eyes the next time he, he had a sling on so I don't know whether he'd been to see another doctor and 
but I had a lovely moment when he started on the guitar now playing um, Spirit Bird. Oh, I love that by song. Rudd. And weirdly, a lot of people know this song, especially in this community, I guess. But uh, I'd only heard it for the first time maybe five days before. And that was really beautiful and magical when I first heard it. Another person was singing it. And um, it's just one of those moments where I was like, he can't be playing that song. Oh, out of all the songs <laughs> in the world, he plays like my current favourite song. Um, so that was like magical like yeah. these things and especially if you're on a drug they seem even more magical and again the lyrics of that seems incredibly profound because she's seen it all before and my head was like looping on itself and I'm like yeah all of these thoughts none of them are new I've seen it all before and the lyrics um something about fading away it all fades, it fades, away. fades away and I was yeah. like good ayahuasca will fade away thank god I was thinking I was also really into that song and I swear even though everyone's insisting to me now that I have heard it before but because I do love Xavier Rudd but I just don't think I'd heard that album that it's on anyway it doesn't matter but um to me it was the first time I'd heard it in that moment and um the it all fades away was really getting to me and I was thinking what happens is the sadness the emptiness the meaningless is always there but our awareness of it fades as we go back into real life yeah and that's kind of a blessing but it's also kind of the sickness of consciousness it itself. is the sickness of consciousness right it's almost like and I do genuinely feel this ayahuasca does seem to be giving you more of what is real it does kind of let you see I mean it's the matrix you know it's that film it's, but does it actually give you what's real or just what's in your head already just put together in a slightly well, different way I, I think it's a more accurate idea of what our minds are actually doing all the mm. time I don't think my mind was doing anything um illogical I think it's thoughts it's trains of thought were logical I was very aware of those thoughts and um it's what my mind I think is always doing but uh the thing the observer let's say um isn't as it, in it it isn't aware of it yeah. my, my observer is just you know it's talking now it's just picking the words it's it's doing all that stuff but it isn't aware of it that's what's so spooky in the ayahuasca thing though because it doesn't feel like it's being generated by your brain. It feels like what Another. you're seeing is true. Like yours, that's, at least that was my experience. It wasn't like, oh, these are just thoughts I'm having. I, I felt like I was seeing something that was profoundly, ultimately true. Yeah. And that I was never going to be able to let go of the fact that that was true. Yeah, exactly. It does exactly feel like that. And that feels like, it feels scary. Yeah. Especially when the thing you're finding out is true is, is disturbing in some way. And not disturbing like, you know, looking like a dead body or something. It's like, it's just uh, like a disturbing thing about consciousness. Yeah. Um, Whew. And then, so I get, I was hoping, uh, because one of the other, one of the few things we did communicate about was uh, they asked us to fill out a form and say that we didn't have any mental illnesses or anything. Yeah, I can't yeah, remember the yeah, questions yeah, to any allergies. I don't think that was even on there. Um, one of the questions on that form was, what's your favorite three songs? <laughs> yeah. So I was thinking... I gave them three songs that I thought would be appropriate to listen to when going through ayahuasca, because that's what I assumed they were going to do with them. And I thought what they're going to do at the end is like put on our favorite songs yeah. to like all bring us out. So I was thinking when I hear the songs that yeah. I chose, it's if I couldn't remember which songs I chose. Yeah, I <laughs> uh, but when I hear a song that is familiar to me, I'll know yeah. that this is coming out. But they never played our favorite songs. They didn't. That was a bit weird. I'm not sure why they asked us the question. Well, I know why they didn't play your favorite songs. Mine was probably inappropriate yeah you put like, like hardcore things. metal yeah, on there and stuff yeah but which really would have been that would have been horrific because <laughs> <laughs> you suddenly like, clicked like, on the death tones yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I put on like Xavier Rudd and like all like hippie nice things that I would like to hear when I was going through I a trip didn't think this through um <laughs> the other thing that I told you which I'm not totally sure see again at the time my train of thought felt very logical here and I think if I was back in that place, I would still think the same thing. But I'm not thinking it anymore. And that was that we definitely do have a soul. Mm. So my train of thought with the ayahuasca was to do with... Um, I was thinking a bit about death and thinking, okay, if, when my body dies, my consciousness dies, or goes away. Like, let's say that that all ends. Is there anything left? And I'd be like, yes, there's like this little glowing dot, um, which feels like that's my soul and that's the thing that's going to go up to the stars, let's say. Don't even know what that means, guys. But it, it definitely felt like a thing at the time. And uh, I remember thinking, but you don't know that to be true. You can't verify that. Like, you were it, thinking that in, oh, whilst yeah, yeah, you were tripping. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've thinking, got to you. Yeah, I know. Oh, trust me. And I was thinking, like, how would I explain this to Rebecca? Um, but then I was thinking, it doesn't matter that I can't verify it. 
I can just choose whatever thought I want and I can choose to believe it because if we don't know what is true, if we can't prove something, why not just pick the thing that feels good? And at that moment, I was like, I want to believe there's a soul. I could believe there's a soul. I'm going to believe that there's a soul. <laughs> and, and that all made a lot of sense at the time. And I, I guess in many ways it still does. Um, it would be so interesting, and maybe again we can talk about this in the second half, to look at the actual interaction that ayahuasca is having because i feel like one of the big things it's messing with is belief mm. like whatever part of your brain makes you believe things that are true yeah that seems to be something that's getting screwed up and um, like rejiggered hang on because it's it's really dealing but it's dealing very much with for many of us thoughts and concepts so it's not like in another say in another trip let's say you're taking as far as i know something like lsd where you're seeing crazy things. And as far as I know, in many other drug experiences, you think that that's in the room. The thing about ayahuasca is your mind is always there. Mm. You're just seeing things. Well, maybe if you're in a very deep trip, maybe you're not. But let's say on the whole, your experience with ayahuasca is you're you, but you're looking at new thoughts, new ways of seeing things. You're seeing your thought processes in a different light. Could yeah. That be the case. Yeah. Whereas it's not like you're seeing like a crazy vision of something happening, and you're like, oh, "Fuck, that's happening. That's real." It it's not that. It really is a new way of seeing the world, of of thinking about things. Yeah, it's definitely. I've I did mushrooms when I was younger, and it was mushrooms is just like swirly things, and sometimes like like a clock like suddenly had eyes and did like face at me. Yeah. It and but I was. I was just like, oh, look, this is a funny thing that's happening to my perception of the world. I didn't oh, feel so like... You, it were was... still will. you were still you. Yeah, but actually with ayahuasca, it felt like this is getting in, to your thoughts. in behind. Yeah, it is. Not just my thoughts, but the way my thoughts are put together. That's exactly it. Yeah, right, right, right. yeah that's no, what no, you're no, saying no. with the process. No, that is it. That is it. Sure, sure, it sure, is... sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it is doing that. Um, but I don't think it's a bad thing. I don't think it's giving you something... You, you still think that. It's not like... Yeah, but I don't want my... my, um, uh, my... It's not changing your thoughts, though. It's not changing your thought process. You're becoming aware of your thought process. Maybe. Maybe. I think I need to think about this a bit more. Because okay. I'm getting into this... Bo- After the... Afterwards, I just couldn't speak for a long, long time. Yeah. And I was just sort of staring blankly at the bowl, which was very comforting and very pleasing. And it wasn't until the next morning when I sort of was able to start articulating yeah. my experience. And now when I start thinking about it, I start losing my words again. Because, yeah, and this is, it's it drove me insane before I did ayahuasca that you ask people what it was like and they say, oh, it's very hard to put into words. Mm. You just have to experience it. It's really difficult to explain. And, but now that's, I feel myself saying, saying that. that. I'm finding it easier this time for some reason. Maybe it's practice make perfect. Maybe. Because I definitely experienced what, some of the same disturbing things that thoughts do uh, the first time around. Yeah. I and mean, this time I think I got it again, but I was able to understand it a bit better. Um, and be comforted by knowing most people who do this do feel like they're going insane. That's quite a normal experience yeah. part of this, which is <laughs> terrifying. Um, and then what's sanity? Um, how would you function in the world if you had it, if your mind was different? These are all the things that if you're given a long period of time, eight hours to think about anything, your mind probably will start doing crazy things. I was thinking that. I was thinking you're a, for a lot of people, people who don't meditate at all, yeah. you're, you're alone with your own thoughts. And I've never it's sat alone with my thoughts for in eight a dark hours room. in a dark room. Like if I've been, sure, I've been feeling unwell for that long. And like, but I'd yeah. always have a book or my phone or someone would yeah. pop in and have a brief chat. But this is like eight hours in Your body nausea. is poisoned. Yeah. yeah. And I thought, like, when I've had bad food poisoning, mm. similar, a similar sort of sadness has yeah. occurred to me. And I haven't had, like, visions, but I've definitely had distortions. Yeah. Like, so I don't know how much... Because I'm sure there is a there must be a way to take the sickness out. Someone must be able to engineer ayahuasca that doesn't make you sick. But maybe if you took the sickness out, right. that would actually stop it having many of the effects. That is very interesting. That could be. Because yeah. being sick, being nauseous, is an effect not just on yes. your body, but on the way you... I think, I don't know, again, something to look into. Yeah. We're promising to look into so many things. Right. But, but re- remember, thick. we are adult, so <laughs> we may not make good on these promises. That's that's the other thing. Like, how um, 
what now? Like, how do we integrate? Well, I figured something out towards the end that really helped. And that was, I had a, a notebook because I was trying to take notes, um, which are a complete mess. I can't even read them. Of um, I have the notebook here. I'll just show Kat. This is this notebook was blank when we went in. I'll try and maybe and now it's put a photo. Really, it was blank. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to try and read oh, that goodness. page of important notes um, that I wrote down to myself? Re- remember is underlined twice. I'd all nonsense be naked more. The bowl. Everything you are. Sound of issues. Real. See above. <laughs> it's all. And, oh, and the see above has an arrow going back to it's all nonsense. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. This is the this is the sort of quality of insight I that I produce. I think we should all take a, a, a leaf out of Rebecca's book and say, "Be naked more," I, I, which I I do think could that be real. About halfway through, I just I really felt like I wanted to get naked. I took I pulled the back of my I had like a cotton hoodie on and I pulled the back up so my whole back was exposed to the air and that felt amazing. And then I took my socks off. <laughs> And got my feet out, and that felt better too. But if I'd been on my own, I would have got naked. I was so desperate to have some air on my skin because it was a yeah. very stuffy room. As I well. think that's the other thing. The idea of being out of that room felt like heaven. Oh, and I kept thinking, wouldn't it be amazing to be swimming in the sea right now? Yeah. And like planning how how fast can I get to the nearest large body of water to get in there? Yeah. Which it's... is because uh, we don't know. Well, I don't know Amsterdam very well. I didn't know where the nearest body of water was, and I was like, oh, I'm uh... never gonna get there. I don't know where it is. Yeah. You feel. I mean, I think this is maybe a a limitation to how ayahuasca is traditionally how we're experiencing it this idea of just kind of being glued to your bed because for a long time I was like I don't think and your muscles are very weak Mm. so um the idea of even going to the toilet felt like a mountain like I couldn't have done that um but at the same time yeah the idea of like air coming through would have been really like for me the element i wanted most was air yeah um, oh yeah there was no windows there's no we windows. Didn't say there were no i windows think that's really room. fucked up and i think the last obviously the place i was before you're in this kind of beautiful traditional um a maloka uh, but it's like a, a round wooden straw tent you know it's like beautiful and traditional um with big open windows yeah it's pitch black like pitch black but wow and with a fire in the middle maybe no that was probably out it was pitch black so the thing that I figured out that made me feel better was trying to draw the bowl. Yes. So I, the rest of my... I've got a few notes similar to the ones that just cat and, read out. And when you're sitting next to somebody who's um, just going like with a circle like quite loudly um, on a page, you're like, oh, yeah, Rebecca's lost her mind. I was trying to keep Re- it Rebecca quiet, but there's like pages and pages. What does that say? Something about cosy? It says make it cosy. Make it cosy. Um, it's just like it's a fairly small book so I've gone off the edge a lot and I just my hand has just been going round and round and round we were talking about circles and about how circles reoccur in like occult practices and stuff yeah and um I was thinking about why that is and how it's just if you give a child a pen this is what they'll do they'll just because it's the way our arms are constructed right and the way they rotate in the oh, sockets yeah. if you start you just give a child a pen they will start drawing circles yeah and I think that's one of the reasons why circles turn up all over the place they're a very basic shape I think that's actually a bad argument because also our elbow just that's that's a kind of more of an up down thing. i guess it depends how you draw but you like how are you going to draw up or down <laughs> you just do dots just do dots yeah <laughs> okay. anyway so I, I yeah i just started drawing these circles and i just kept as soon as i felt like one was full like there are some that i've crossed out because they've they've gone wrong somehow i don't know why they're wrong because they look all the same they're just circles and circles. There were some that were really good, yeah. Like I, I quite like that one. Let's put some photos of these up on the Instagram. I'll try and find one that's gone wrong. Oh yeah, that one no, went wrong. It went wrong. And I, I was displeased with it. And I, I wrote two, but I didn't know what it was. Two. <laughs> it was two something. Two. Just two. It was just wrong that circle. Yeah. So that helped, and I, I felt like I was coming out of it then. But I also felt like I wasn't going to be able to stop drawing the circles. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised. So. Eventually, I mean, after like all of the time in the world has passed. <laughs> that is what it felt like. We were presented with some little bowls of fruit, which I will say were pretty perfect because, you know, we started at noon. This is about eight, or seven, no, probably about 7.30 when we were given the, um, uh, the bowls of fruit. And they're like perfectly small because you definitely don't feel like eating after this, even though you're like hungry, you haven't had anything, yeah. you've been puking. Um, but just like the perfectly small bits of fruit. And I remember being like, just going really slowly and being like, Oh, one of my messages was like, trust your body. And I remember thinking, yeah, I'm just like an animal. I know exactly how much fruit to have and like everything as well. So that was like quite Were comforting. you eating with your hands? Sometimes I yeah, was. Yeah, I was eating with my hands. I just couldn't manage <laughs> the spoon. The spoon was too much. But it was hilarious like how, yeah, slowly you have to go. And yeah. it was quite like, there's something quite like sweet and uh, 
I mean, we, again, something else we talked about beforehand, which I think, be careful about what you talk about beforehand because it will affect <laughs> your trip. Uh, vulnerability. And I'm yeah. just being like, ah, oh, everything is so vulnerable. And it's, it's like nice to embrace that. I was thinking about, I went to a monkey sanctuary once and there was, um, uh, they put out fruit for the monkeys, very similar fruit cut up into small bits. And they were talking about how, uh, I, I'll probably get this wrong, so fact check me, please. But as I remember it, the man was saying, like, lemurs have can only see in black and white, but these monkeys can see in colour. And so the lemurs will just eat any fruit because they don't know what's what. Right. Whereas the monkeys that can see in colour will pick the the ones that taste best oh, like based on colour. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you'll see, like, if you go and look at a pile of fruit, you'll see who's been there to eat. Oh. Because the monkeys that can see in colour are more discriminate because they know yes. what's good. And I was doing that, I was like... Because it was all, it was basically all melon. Yeah. Like yellow. Oh, I really wanted more melon. There's a bit of kiwi. Oh, maybe I got more melon than you. Uh, and then a few grapes. And yeah. the grapes were like bright red. And I was like, oh yeah, grapes. Yeah. So I'll just pick <laughs> all those out and eat them like a monkey. Um, and then we were also offered a uh, dinner as well. Madrid. Which I was not expecting at all. No. I had heard somebody talk about dinner, but like, anyway. Uh, yeah, like rice and like a, a sweet and sour stir fry, which is kind of gross. But at this point, I was eating in a way... Like, um, you know, to almost sober yourself up, like yeah. you might do if you've had too much to drink. You're like, I'm just going to try to eat to soak this up. I was so glad that you got up because they set this up in the other room. Yeah. And it almost felt rude. For me, I was like, oh God, they really want us all there. But there wasn't even enough room for everyone. Really? Yeah. It was ridiculous. Well, Marguerite did keep saying, I've cooked for 12 and it's getting cold and everyone get up. And yeah. there was one woman still being sick. Yeah. And there was me just eating fruit. Well, not even eating. I was just stationary looking at my fruit. <laughs> And there was no way I was getting up anytime no, soon. No, and I can't imagine, if I had drunk again, I can't imagine of being sober by then. Like, there was no way. But there was one guy, he was amazing. He yeah. just jumped up as soon as I mentioned the food. He's like, oh, I am a bit peckish. Yeah. Even before that, he got up and played the guitar, I think. Hang on, are you talking about the guy who was doing the annoying drumming? Yeah. He got up and played the guitar. never gu- playing guitar. Oh, okay. Maybe that was a vision. That's weird. And also, you've never spoken that positively about this man. <laughs> you've been like that annoying, crazy man who was jumping up and banging the d- drum really loud, which he was. I was trying to be nice. Um, yeah. <laughs> he was, was a lovely a man, man, but um, yeah, it was it was annoying me at the time. And as soon as people started coming around and started talking and I was still lying there and they were all just saying things and it was all nonsense, which is unsurprising because everything nonsense. was nonsense. But yeah. this was real nonsense. It was just like... Mm. Oh, what are the people who live in Sydney like? Oh, they're like this. Oh, what are the people are like in New Zealand? Oh, they're like this. And they're just yeah. saying like... It, it was like... I was occasionally jumping in, but it did feel like the most arbitrary chat in the world. And it was so superficial. Yeah, superficial. It was just really weird. And I was like, oh, what are you all saying? And then the and then they started coming around, Marguerite and um, the guy whose name escapes Justin. me. My brain is broken. Justin, <laughs> lovely Justin, started coming around and saying to people, how was your journey? Yeah. And they got around to this guy who was in the corner and he said, um, he said, oh, how was your journey? I know that you were trying to work through some stuff with a breakup. Yeah. And the guy started talking about his breakup and I was like, oh, this is sort of nonsense. Why is he talking about his breakup? This is so stupid. And it did feel very cold, like the conversation between them. It was like, this is a kind of very personal conversation. You're having it to the room. Um, and like Justin wasn't saying the right things and I kept being like yeah there is something like just slightly off it's like in the same way that you might see a vision with ayahuasca and realise that it's plastic or cardboard that's how yes. all of that felt yeah. yeah and I feel bad saying it because he was you know he was being honest and he was talking about something that was obviously really hurt him but at the time from my experience yeah it was just nonsense sounds yeah. that he was making and I was like doesn't he understand that none of this is real like yeah. what, what and also yeah like it's weird kind of being half back because at this point I, like I feel like most of me was put together again um but still like you're shaken from like a very profound experience and it feels weird not to honor that and here was my this is probably my big criticism of this particular place was there's no like closing ceremony there's no no no, no ceremony to it which I don't like I, I felt like if you're gonna do this all together embrace that part of it and you know do it properly um somebody give a little, you know, a closing chant or, you know, blow yeah. out a candle, like do something. Or a sharing circle. And and that was very much needed, which was never formally done, yeah. which was a shame. Well, there was this going around, how was your journey? And then the, the next guy who spoke, the older guy, he said, how was your journey? And he started talking about how his dad died and how, you know. But it he... was personal, like we didn't get to share with the group. Yeah, which... but this was the, this was when I thought, oh no, my brain might be properly broken because he started talking about his dad dying and I was thinking, this is nonsense. Oh no. Yeah. 
Or like I was like, this is all. This is the same nonsense I've been hearing. This is the same nonsense about people in Sydney work out too much, and that guy broke up with his girlfriend, and this guy's dad is dead, and all are equally nonsense. I was like, oh my god, am I never going to be able to readjust to? Um... Can I not care about anything ever again? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Am I not going to be able to weight things properly or care about things again? Um... So that that was very disorienting. Yes, um... <laughs> and it's probably. Is it? Do you think it's too soon to ask you? <laughs> If this is lingered. I mean, the next day you said, oh yeah, that, that old Rebecca, she's gone now. Yeah, I don't know. Um, mm, give me a minute. No, but I would want to give you, you know, they say it's, it kind of works, it's magic for a good six months. Oh, great. Yeah, so we've got six <laughs> months of this madness. So Kat goes and eats and you talk to some people there. Yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's just like, it's more nonsense chat, but... Like, it's fine. It's... And at some point, it stopped feeling like nonsense and started feeling quite comforting that people were, that people were back, getting back into life around again. me. And this is all I needed. All I needed was to know I'm not alone anymore and that other people are saying... And this Irish guy was... You know, I talk about the looping thoughts, which I find disturbing, and he was like, yeah, that's basically what my brain was doing the whole time. It, oh, wow. Like, you have yeah. a thought, and then your brain tries to process the thought, and that in itself is quite frustrating. Um, and... Did you hear about anyone else's trip? No, no one kind of gave the lowdown in a way that it's almost like people were being too polite. It felt like almost indulgent to talk too much about your trip. I honestly think that, that that's wow. what everyone was going that's through. Weird. And this is why I think it's so important to have a formal sharing circle so that everyone has their time to ramble on about their thing. Even if it's boring, even if it takes like an hour, which at Dreamblade it did. You'd do it the next morning and everyone would share. And it felt really important to do that yeah. and I'm glad we have this podcast to do that quite honestly because not being able to do that is not good I did overhear one guy talking about um, someone asked him was your experience sexual oh yeah I remember that and um, and he said if it's not too personal to ask and the guy said what did he say? It is personal, but I'll answer anyway. Yeah, <laughs> which is weird. And then he was like, it was sexual, but not in the way you're thinking, not in the conventional sense. Yeah. I was like a lion standing on the edge of a cliff. And I was just standing there right on the edge of the cliff and staring out. And I was just roaring and roaring and roaring. Yeah, asserting like some kind of like power. And yeah, I was like, dominance? He was like, no, no, no. It was kind of like just roaring for the hell of it. Yeah, because asserting your existence, existence is existence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a very masculine energy, he said. And I was like, whoa, that sounds interesting. Yeah. So I would have liked to hear more from everyone. All of that kind of stuff, yeah. And then what was really weird, I was still in the bed. Everyone else, not everyone else, there was one woman, oh, she was really yeah. sick. She was very quiet and still the whole time. And she kind of got up and was very shaky on her way to and from the loo. And she looked at me and she asked if I was all right. Oh. And I was like, I have to say something nice to this woman. Think of something nice to say. What do people like to hear? And I said, you have a happy face. And she That's was... <laughs> so weird. Oh and she smiled God. at me and then went off. <laughs> I think I was trying to say your face makes me happy or it's nice to see you. Or... Um... That's probably the weirdest thing I've heard. Uh... <laughs> so I think I might have even done like a little, like put my fingers underneath my face in case <laughs> I meant her face. Like your your face, ha I'm pointing and sort of gesturing to my face to show that. Framing her face yeah. <laughs> uh, with her hands. So obviously you had some more tripping to do at yeah. that point. <laughs> So, yeah, and then um, I'm still lying down. I can hear mm. you guys talking, eating. I can smell food and it smells like disgusting. So I'm yeah, glad I didn't get up. And I also don't want to have the conversation about checking whether it's vegan or not. I'm like, no, let's just yeah, stick to the yeah. fruit. We know that's safe. And I don't have to leave my little cozy bed. And then Marguerite comes over and says, I'm going now. I yeah. just want to say goodbye. I'm like, you're going? Right. And that is very weird. Like both the facilitators kind of just took off. They left. They left. So there's 10 of us. Yeah. In mattresses, it's in like, an industrial estate, in a here. foreign country. You can go. It doesn't really matter. If you've got a free bed or not, it doesn't really matter. Everyone can just do what they want. And I had no idea how we were getting home either, because, as I said, it was the middle of nowhere. Yeah, I was scared that the Uber wouldn't come. Um, That's when I was just like, oh, well, nothing matters anyway, and Kat will sort it all out. It, which, and I just completely, like, divested all responsibility. I'm so glad you were there. I was just so glad you could move. Because my big fear was trying to get you into an Uber if you couldn't move. Um, but we were fine. Yeah. We, were fine. we I mean, sort of scrabbled around and got our stuff. Yeah. And got down the stairs. Wait, the wait, stairs wait. were intense. What was the thing that you wanted to take? Oh, yeah. So I said to Kat, like, I don't know. This was before they left. Before yeah. the facilitators left. Um, and they both came and said goodbye to us. And then did, said goodbye to everyone about, like, 300 times. And then eventually left. Um, but before they left, I, it occurred to me that I needed to take the bowl. 
needed to take the ball. And the, I had an idea of like, I just needed the ball. <laughs> I don't know exactly why, but it was very important to me that I had the bowl. And I was thinking, would would a photograph suffice? And I was like, no, I actually need this bowl. But then they were gone, so I had no one to ask if I could take it. And it's probably like what seventy p seventy I mean, pence. Yeah, it's a it's a white plastic bowl. So what I did is I counted how many. Oh, I said to Cat, I need this. I need to take this bowl. Do you think it'd be okay if I take the bowl? Yeah. And you were like, yeah, yeah, just take it. And I was like, I was kind of like also like not really. What if they have a ceremony tomorrow? I think we've discussed yeah. that. I was like, you could probably find one on Amazon. Like, not yeah, understanding the real yeah. significance of the bowl. Um, and and then I counted the bowls that were there, and there were more than there were mattresses. Yeah. So I thought, okay, so they probably would not be happy that a bowl was missing, but also it won't inconvenience them too much. Yeah. And there is no one to ask. And also... We were inconvenienced this morning. Exactly. That was part of it. I was like, tit for tat, you leave us waiting out in the rain. We steal your bowl. Confused. We're going to steal your bowl. <laughs> so I took the bowl, got all our stuff. We got down the stairs, which was on our shaky legs, which yeah. was crazy. Yeah, very Then, crazy. luckily, I checked my coat pockets yeah. because my phone wasn't there and I had to go back and rummage through. And I just went back, barged into the room where everyone was, rummaged around on the floor until I found my phone and then held it in the yeah. air, looked at them all in the eye <laughs> and then left. <laughs> I forgot. My my other, like, my very weird ending was um, having gone to the toilet. I left the toilets, washing my hands in the sink. I was kind of in a corner um, and Magritte came <sighs> just before just to you know, before she said goodbye to everyone and kind of said like, you know, how are you doing? But stood very close to me, very, very close to me. Like her, her head was just, and I'm English. Like I'm not used to people being particularly close to me. Uh, her head was very, very close to mine. It's like a hand's breadth And away. also because I'm in a corner, I can't get around her. I can't step back to create more space. Um, and she's looking very intensely with these, the big owl eyes. Yeah, we haven't actually described what she looked like. She's wearing all white, yeah. as were a couple of people. We yeah. weren't told to wear all white, so we weren't. But And she has beautiful blonde hair, very fair skin, very slim, and um, these big black-rimmed glasses that must be very strong because yeah. they make her eyes look massive. Huge. And she was kind of like, you know, and not really saying anything and there wasn't really anything to say. And there was this like this strange moment where I was like, she's either going to try to kiss me, she's going to like do something. Like, I felt very strange um and eventually I kind of like shuffled around and I looked down to the ground and said I need to call an uber and she was like okay and so that was my strange ending but at least you didn't fight her but it's quite possible that like the drug was just making me think that I she was very very close to me and it was probably complete and, and the time was going very slowly <laughs> yeah so it's probably a totally normal no she was intense very you, intense when I got up to go to the loo at the end um, she pounced on you too. <laughs> she quite, she didn't pounce, but she hugged me and she said, I'm really glad you're here. And she looked at me with her <laughs> it's that, eyes. It's that yeah. weirdness. It's and really she said, you, you should come again. And I was like, I don't, I don't, uh, 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 it just made noises. Because there is no way I'm ever doing that again. I say that now, but you know, well, that's yeah. probably what you said after the first time too. Yeah. And that time especially, I was like, no, no, no. There's a limit to how many times you can do ayahuasca. I think, you know, the more you do it, the less the more chances there are that you will go insane so we get in the uber we do. and it's a full moon oh yeah which is beautiful nice. and the moon looks like the bowl so that's yeah. very comforting i was worried that the uber driver thought that i was sick and that's why i had the bowl to be sick in oh yeah he probably did think that yeah he did say something like are you okay or are you in a rush or he didn't did he say i don't know but it was strange because i couldn't really understand words at this point no he was trying to make conversation he seemed very nice yeah. but we were just both like gesturing at the moon <laughs> mutely basically <laughs> And he was asking us questions like, oh, have you seen much of Amsterdam? Have you mm. been to this place? Have you been to that place? I could barely handle it. And yeah. you, you were just silent. I yeah. was like, fair <laughs> enough. I'm going to try to take one from the team. She's only had... Like, because I had that... I only had one cup. Yeah. Which is still wild that I had quite that experience on one cup. Um, but you'd have the second one. And I was thinking, oh my God, I'm so glad I hadn't had more. Yeah. But then I wonder... How much difference does do the other doses make? It's such a strange thing that it's so unpredictable. Um, you might think that you're getting off scot free. You might drink like there are plenty of people who drink quite a lot in one night and uh, don't feel it. It's and apparently, so it's variable night to night because it makes sense night that it would vary person, person to person, right? Because we're but, different brain chemistry. Sure. But if that she said they were giving the same brew yeah. every time, and yeah. you asked, no, maybe I asked. Anyway, one of us asked, do you mix it up differently yeah. or is it always the same? And she said, no, it's, it's always the same. the same. Yeah, it's it is very strange and. Um, I don't understand this stuff. I was well. so, so pleased to get home. And just like I'd been envisioning the whole time, the little glowing Airbnb where everything is safe and nice and Paula's there, 
he was there just like in it was amazing yeah very comforting actually yeah just and it, he just sat with way. us and let us be, ramble be crazy <laughs> yeah he's very good at that yes. he's very supportive he also produces this podcast we never give him props for that but he produces this podcast as well he's amazing he's a rock yeah. um, and now we just have to figure out what it all means right stay tuned <laughs> This show has already taken us to some strange places, literally and metaphysically, and we love making it for you. If you enjoy listening and have a dollar a month to spare, we'd appreciate your support on Patreon. Patreon is a platform for supporting content creators like us. If you pledge one dollar a month, we'll spend it on boring things like hosting fees and audio equipment. And fun things like psychic readings, crystal healing, ayahuasca retreats. Yeah, we'll spend it on drugs. There are lots of adventures we'd like to go on. So if you want us to go hunting for the Loch Ness Monster, visit a haunted castle or Area 51, you're going to have to chip in. We think having conversations about this stuff, you know, paranormal, spiritual, weird stuff, is really important, especially between people who don't agree. Having these experiences is fun, doing the research is interesting, but the most important thing is the conversations. We hope listening to our podcast will inspire you to start talking to people you would normally dismiss as grumpy old skeptics or flaky woo-woo seekers. If you think these sorts of conversations are important too, you can support us on Patreon. And as a supporter, for as little as a dollar, you'll be able to vote on upcoming show ideas. And if there's something you're desperate for us to look into, whether it's acupuncture or vampires, Patreon supporters' requests will always go to the top of our consideration list. Find out more at patreon.com slash seeker skeptic. And that's Patreon spelt P-A-T-R-E-O-N. We're back. And we're more or less over. So how did this whole experience, I'm just realizing, I just re-listened to that recording and I said, wow, so many times. And that is, that is what I came away with, a strong wow. In fact, we should make this into a drinking game where you have to take a shot of ayahuasca every time I say wow. Yes, yes. We should, we should. <laughs> a horrible, horrible drinking game. <laughs> um, well, it's all that you can really say about ayahuasca, I think. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. How did, how did it compare to your experience in Peru? So, yeah, so I went to... Uh, Peru, a place called Dream Glade, um, just a- about a year ago before we we went to Amsterdam, and um, yeah, I mean, I guess I wanted to go to the the heart of it, right? So this place called Iquitos in Peru is is quite well known for the ayahuasca trade, and that maybe started in the nineties. It got popular there, um, and before going, I was sent some information about uh, a kind of two week prep period where you uh, diet on out, out certain foods. So um, there are different recommendations for this depending on who you ask, and some people are more strict about it than others. But this particular place um, was quite encouraging to, to do this. So you're eliminating, two weeks before taking ayahuasca, you're eliminating foods containing tyramine. Um, and there is actually a kind of scientific um, reason for this. So um, What's tyramine? It's, it's a, an amino acid. Ah, I could be wrong. No, I'm pretty sure it's an amino acid. Yes. So, um, as as I mentioned, ayahuasca is an MAO inhibitor, and that's how you, you trip out. Um, but this enzyme, tyramine, is essential to. Um, sorry, yeah, that enzyme is essential to process the amino acid tyramine, and basically, it's important to not eat foods high in that amino acid. Otherwise, your body could be reach toxic levels of that and you get headaches or hypertension yeah i read that combining um mao inhibitors is like with certain foods can cause really severe reactions and and that's it um so those are things like pork red meat aged cheeses fermented foods yogurt uh alcohol um protein powders aspartame large large amounts of chocolate peanuts in large amounts coffee did you say coffee getting to that so then there's other <laughs> things and this this these aren't the tyramine containing foods but in, in addition to um, that you want to avoid salt refined sugar spicy food dairy oils caffeine um and as well as drugs and there's a theory there which would be things like salt and sugar and oil red meat um garlic spices um at, at one point these would have been you know, very, very valuable. So it's kind of like giving them up as like a sacrifice, um, a re- an, an act of respect to the to the spirit of the vine, obviously. That makes more sense to me than 
necessarily being super dangerous because the UDV, that church, which we'll probably talk about a bit about later, who um who use ayahuasca in their ceremonies they don't bother with this these the dietary diet. restrictions at all That's and they have loads of people going through their ceremonies all the time and they've been doing it for ages um not that i mean that doesn't mean anything but it's just it makes me think oh it can't be that important it can't be that bother. important and that's the thing um i think other things that are more important are um not taking both prescription drugs like uh, antidepressants mao inhibitors sleep medications um beta blockers um, as well as regular street drugs. So uh, even marijuana, which I was kind of surprised by because I thought, ah, you know, it's a plant medicine, right? Um, but they kind of say that it's a different spirit and it doesn't get along with ayahuasca, the spirit of ayahuasca. Which is unfortunate for us because we, we smoked up <laughs> We were in Amsterdam, before. for God's sake. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, and, and most centers strongly recommend that you avoid uh, sexual activity Um and basically any exchange of bodily fluids um, as it's a powerful energetic exchange and that can deplete your reservoir of energy available um, and inhibit the effectiveness of the plants. So yeah, uh, basically no fun for a couple of weeks before <laughs> and after uh, and obviously during. Um, there was something else. So when I got to the centre, um, I was picked up from a place in Nikitos. The guy was about 45 minutes late. Um, a scary looking guy. Wow. Yes, a scary looking <laughs> dude from Wolverhampton. But who actually turned out to be a, a sweetheart. So that's all fine. Um, and one of the first things we did was talk about um, a plant dieta that he suggested I go on. Because everyone, I think pretty much everyone apart from me was doing this in the end. He managed to sell them it. It was $90 for the week. Um, and you're basically doing eating the same food as everyone else, but you take this additional drink of a uh, a particular plant um, in order to kind of like deepen your uh, experience with ayahuasca. But I mean, it's weird because I've heard about people doing dietas just on these plants because th these are all sacred plants, right? These are power plants. Um, so you could do this without the ayahuasca. And the Dream Glade offered and recommended aho sacha, which is roughly translated as wild jungle garlic, because it really does have a strong garlic taste and smell. Mm. Um, yeah, it's pretty interesting. It's like you have to drink this big green juice of a garlic drink. Um, and, it's like and, a garlic smoothie. Yes, and, and they grow this stuff on the premises, whereas they don't grow the ayahuasca vine or shakruna on the premises. Um, so then there are there are other ones, like, oh man, there are loads. Um, Planta de Vida... Uh, Pinion Colorado it's worth looking these up because you could technically do a dieta on these um, if you're scared of the stronger ayahuasca experience and when you're saying a dieta you mean taking it every day for a yeah. sustained period and an extreme dieta would be like you're not eating either you're just drinking the plant um, and this is what I read when I was reading about the history of um, and the ritual use for shamans and stuff. Yeah. To become a shaman, that's basically what you have to do. You have to do like uh, the, people give you different numbers, but you have to like do ayahuas ayahuasca every night, and you have to not do any any of the stuff you just listed: the red meat, the sex, any yeah. anything fun for that whole period. Yeah. And then eventually you go through enough ceremonies, and then you can become a shaman. But interestingly, they say if you um. Like heart, you get part way to being a shaman, and then you get magical powers. And if you use them for bad, then you lose your chance to become a shaman, and you just become a sorcerer. Yeah, um, or a brujo. Ah, brujo is that what that Did means? Did you hear that term? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't know how it was said though, because I was just reading it. <laughs> they are mean. You want to watch out for those guys, right? I've I've read a lot of <laughs> accounts where, oh, this is a great book. I'll we'll put a link in the show notes by Alan Shoemaker, who talks about his experience with the plant and his experience with meeting these kind of unsavory characters. Um, anyway, I, I don't believe anyone was like that at Dreamglade. In fact, they were incredibly friendly. And um, so on my first day there, um, the, the ceremony would start in the evening. So unlike um, the place in Amsterdam, it's, an, it's a night plant. And that was kind of like interesting for me in Amsterdam. I think I said to you, oh, we shouldn't be doing this in the day. It's, it's meant to be in the <laughs> evening. Um, so I think it was about 7 p.m. We all sit down in what they call a maloka, which is like a ceremonial um, wooden tent. It's kind of circular building. Um, and you were just out in the rainforest. Oh, man, like beyond beautiful. Like I can't express Aww. that enough. Uh, and, and it's a small little place and 
a very very beautiful and clean and lovely facility for anyone interested um anyway so you've got nine beds um in a circle they don't um uh make it any bigger than that sorry nine guests plus two facilitators and two shaman or curanderos um you've just got your mattress some blankets and a bucket your favorite thing (laughs) <laughs> and uh, was it a bucket was how did it compare to the bowl it was not white it, it was like that mm. though i think they're, they're pretty pretty much the same you know like something you put in your sink um and for the first time it's you get a very in-depth lowdown by the facilitator so i was the only new person that day so drew came and just sat with me and um gave me a very reassuring talk talking me through basically every aspect of the ceremony um after that we're in darkness now, but there's a fire in the middle. So there's a really nice kind of environment. Um, and the space is smudged with Palo Santo. So it's just burn and... Uh, drew. Was that like a, a bit of wood? Yes, yes. They're like sticks of wood. And if you've heard of sage smudging, it's the same situation. You kind of, you're just burning a plant and... Oh, um, yeah. Wave, sage, wave, sage, waving it around. Sage smudging. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's clearing the space and, you know, kind of making it clean, as it were. Um, same with another thing called Agua Florida, um, but rather than it being sprayed in a water bottle, <laughs> like uh, in Amsterdam, this is actually done in the traditional way. And there is a name for this, but I, I've forgotten the name. But you basically take a swig in your mouth and spray it over people, like spitting at them, which is a bit weird. But like, I actually prefer that than the the water bottle because that felt like I was yeah. Who's doing this? Is this the shaman? And or the this is this is the facilitator. So that would have been Stacey. So it's the guy from Wolverhampton. Wolverhampton is doing that, um, and Drew, the American guy who I really warm to, was doing the uh, smudging. But they're both kind of like doing this, and every night one of them would stay sober and one of them would drink. So they'd always have one sober person. That um, seems very sensible. And first timers also only get half a dose, so we're all called up individually. Um, so you have a kind of like private time with you and not private time, but you know, you're not, the, the circle is quite uh, big. So whereas in uh, Amsterdam, it was very tight when we went to drink, we were all kind of sitting around together, like you could touch each other. Whereas here, you actually have to get off your bed to walk over to the the area of the shamans and the facilitators. Anyway. Um, which kind of just adds to the ceremony, I guess. Uh, so you get your dose, which, and the drink here was a lot thicker and more plum-like than... <laughs> well, I wonder, because you said that thing about Syrian rue and that it can be derived from that. Yeah. And on the Wikipedia page it on ayahuasca, it says that sometimes places in Europe do use Syrian rue because it's more easily available. I think which that's made me think, almost definitely Perhaps what that's we what we took. I, yeah. I really do think that. It made a lot of sense to me especially just because both the drinks, we had the Shakrina blends and the Siri Nuri stuff at all, Ayahuasca. Like, they were both very thin. Um, mm. Normally, Ayahuasca is, like, really super dark and thick, like a dark, sticky red wine. Um, but, yeah, they're, they're always different because this is, you know, it's different every time, um, almost. Uh, what happened then? So I, we drank the drink. We were given the instructions to keep sitting up for the first 20 minutes after drinking, um, and really try our hardest not to purge in that time. Um, and we're in silence at that point. But after the 20 minutes are up, the shaman, Lydia and Raoul, start singing. And these are they're singing ikaros, which are basically prayers, um, uh, ways of kind of like keeping the bad spirits out and drawing the good spirits in. And, and they're really beautiful. Perhaps we'll put one in at the yes. beginning of the show so people can hear what they're like, because they're, they are beautiful. I mean, I've only heard them on YouTube, but... Yeah. No. I'm sure in person it's much more beautiful. And, and and apparently something that traditionally shamans do is they kind of write their own music, you know? They uh they work with the plant and kind of the plant teaches them the song in theory. Um, oh that's interesting because that's what the um the Santo Dame, that's the other church that uses ayahuasca. That's what they do too. They um they get transmissions yes, from the exactly. vine and it gives them hymns, yeah. I mean it's all they are in the tradition um, but yeah, the, the shamans that we had, they were like the real deal, um, basically. They are from the Shipibo tribe or Shipibo community, who are sort of like the natives of that particular area. Um, Is it normal to have a female shaman, though? I feel like I always hear them being male, like everything I've read. And in fact, some traditions don't even allow women to drink ayahuasca. In fact, no. the majority of traditions no don't way. allow women to drink 
ayahuasca. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, Lydia is fantastic. Um, and basically at a young age, she was observed that she had certain abilities. And so straight away went into training. Um, and she spent several years deep in the jungle um, in almost total seclusion on doing the dieting. Um, and they were they are cousins. And um, I think Raoul, he's 60, but he looks like, you know, he's half the age. Um, <laughs> and he's been doing it for f- 40 years. Um, so could you could they speak English? If they could, not a lot. So they were pretty much always translated. They would ah, okay. they would speak a bit of Spanish, but not um, not English. And they weren't speaking Spanish most of the time. They were speaking. Uh, no, somebody tell me what the language of the Shipibo people are. But like, there's a language. Yeah. Um. So that was a shame. But that they were fantastic. And uh, if you wanted to request like some time with them i think you could um so the trips themselves i i drank on three occasions with a day off in between um and the first experience wasn't insane i kind of felt it physically like i was a bit tingly quite similar to the the initial part of my trip in in amsterdam um and then uh i but the thing is on this night i didn't purge and I didn't really, I felt like a bit sick, but, you know, I kind of rode it out. And at the end of the night at 1am, they closed the ceremony, drew, um, actually you go up for a healing with one of the shamans. So you take it in turns. It's either going to be Lydia or Raoul, and they both have their ways of healing you. Um, they might kind of like touch you a little bit, not in a weird way, but, you know, hold your hand or put their hands on your head. Um, and are they taking ayahuasca too? The they, shamans? they, they. As far as I know, they are drinking a bit, but okay. like, I think after because that's a... another thing I read about the traditional thing that um, in uh, sort of uh, rural shamans are much more likely in, traditionally to drink themselves and and get high and then heal people, yeah, and um, do sorcery and do all sorts of divination and stuff. Whereas a more urban shaman is much more likely to administer it in the way that we experience where they actually give it to their clients. Yeah. But traditionally a rural shaman will drink it themselves and then use the, the trance that they get into as like a portal to the other realm to bring back information and to, to do magic. Basically. Exactly. That's like how they're getting their information. So that is what they're doing. Um, and so, yeah, I didn't purge in the next day. Cause the next day we have um, a sharing circle in the morning. So, um, uh i said you know i didn't purge but my experience was quite fine um and then stacy the facilitator said to um lydia and Raoul, like what do you have to say i mean lydia you did the healing with her um what's the deal with cat why didn't she purge and lydia what's wrong with her basically yeah and like lydia was like oh you have a blockage in your stomach she kind of like motioned towards her stomach and stacy translated so that was interesting. I was like, I don't really know what that means. Um, I am not constipated. I am fine. Uh, what could this mean? Anyway, uh, they didn't let me go after that. Like that afternoon, or maybe it was, yeah. No, the the next day, so the day of the second trip, I was, um, they said, oh, we can give you like a purgative to help with this. And this meant drinking a lot of lemongrass tea, like a warm, slightly warm tea and like, doing it by the pint so just downing this um and it- are they explaining why it's so important to purge to you no i couldn't that's, seem that's to get weird. that information so it was kind of just like oh it just needs to happen because then the plant will work and and here's the thing i have come to see that once you do purge that is often when the trip takes off yeah that i mean so, that, that seems to be our experience yeah. yeah um and i think a lot I, i've been reading a lot about this the purging thing and there was an interesting facebook uh, discussion um in an ayahuasca group i'm in and basically everyone's got a different opinion and there doesn't seem to be any hard um take on it and some people say you can kind of get away with just yawning um or laughing or crying and that's all a form of a purge um and other people are just like oh i always puke and i poop and it's like crazy it it doesn't seem to have <sighs> people make what they want of it but i will yeah. say that I did end up having on the second night. So after I did take all the lemongrass stuff, um, that was the night I purged. And it's true that I had more of an intense experience 
on that time. But all that. I've ha- also read that. Um, sorry, <laughs> I've also read that uh, apparently often the first experience is not as intense as the second because um, all those MAO inhibitors that are, uh, are bouncing around in your stomach already or your your liver wherever they live. Well, she was pointing to your stomach. Ah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, they um, they can even though you've taken the inhibitor, they might still be around the um, for sure the acids, I, which yeah. I could so that. Y- you use them up with the first dose. And then the second dose is more intense. That's what people have been saying. Yeah, it makes it makes some sense. Um, even though some people might never have a good trip and some people have one from the first. It's so different. Um, and anyway, the uh, the thing that did I did see on that second occasion were some little small spirit-like creatures with Mickey Mouse gloves um, and faces that looked like leaves. Um, and they came and did work on my belly and by work I mean it was like having a little massage so I really did feel as if I had somebody's fingers um imagine if somebody just got all their fingers and kind of like uh you know like started how, or, rummaging around yeah in your almost like how a, a cat does that kind of kneading thing oh. um so it, it definitely felt like something and I was like oh they're doing something and obviously my imagination connected it to what Lydia had said um then that was the night that one of the girls got uh kind of lost basically in the plant world she was basically losing her mind um even when she opened her eyes all she could see was a kind of mean looking jungle you know animals and plants and um yeah she didn't have a good experience so could you hear her could you see her having this bad experience Um, you you couldn't really see anything because we were in pitch darkness but she was taken out of the maloka and they sat with her all the night. I think she weed on one of them. You know, it was <laughs> like, I don't know how that happened. Or she like puked on one of them and then wet herself. Like, it was a mess. Um, and I, I really, yeah, I mean, it's it's not, it's no joke. This. What did she say the next, did you ask her? She was just like happened? very quiet the next day. Because I'd been chatting to her like Aww. the previous two days. But that day she pretty much needed a, a time out, I think. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, because also having experience like that, it didn't seem to to really give her any like information like something you hear about a lot is somebody comes to a realization about something and i've been lucky enough to have some of those but uh that didn't sound like that that just sounded like a mean scary experience um so yeah um but on, on the final night um the final night weirdly i didn't purge again but it was by far the most intense um so we were asked just like a um in ayahuasca um sorry in Amsterdam we were asked if we wanted a second drink that this happened every night and sometimes even a third but uh and they would kind of come around to you individually so it wouldn't disrupt the ceremony at all somebody would just a facilitator would come around and say how are you doing kind of shine a light on your face and make sure that you weren't like <laughs> too far gone and this night I, I think I said I didn't want another drink or maybe I did have another drink but either way Stacey at some point gave me handed me a really elaborate looking pipe and this pipe was meant to be um cooked in ayahuasca and but it was all like i thought whatever he's given me like i trust him somehow um i'm just gonna smoke whatever he gives me i wonder what i'm smoking (laughs) um and after that like i had this beautiful like the rest of the night was just i could when i closed my eyes i could just see these plants and they all looked as if they were like dancing for me like it was you know without every time i talk about it i sound like just the most ridiculous um <laughs> you know ah oh, tri- tripped out person um but it was just really pleasant and feeling love and like all of the good things um and it was already pleasant until the ceremony ended so uh at this point what drew would do was he would kind of close it by singing some um chants in I wouldn't say like what Sanskrit like a Sanskrit chant yeah um and up until then I'd really enjoyed it but for some reason the looping effect it had uh it kind of threw my thoughts into a loop which I was scared about obviously when I went to Amsterdam and it did still happen so it feels like this is just an experience I'm gonna have now when I take ayahuasca and it is really terrifying because every time I think I am gonna lose my mind and it won't stop looping I won't stop being really like aware of my thoughts on this strange, irritating level. Um, yeah, that sounds really unpleasant. And, and that one, because I hadn't had that before, 
I, I really was scared for the rest of the night. And because the ceremony had closed and we were all like sleeping uh, and it still wouldn't end. That what was sort of thoughts unpleasant. were they? Were they bad no, thoughts? Or was it just the fact they were repeating that was bad? That's it. They weren't bad thoughts. It was just like the constant voice that we normally have in our heads which is very like sometimes it's subtle sometimes it's louder like if you need to think something through you hear yourself right but Mm. every time I had a thought I was like I'm sure I've just thought that or like it was just this weird distance which was quite unpleasant and I don't know if that was anything to do with like you know people talk about um the ego dissolution but it, it it wasn't like that it was more like it, it was the realization that these thoughts aren't me. But to add it to that, it was, but if my thoughts aren't me, then I am nothing. And that was not good. It's not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, after that, the next morning in the sharing, sorry, I did manage to fall asleep and obviously my brain wasn't broken. I returned to the real world. Uh, very, very relieved. And I asked Stacy, like, what the fuck was in that pipe? And he was like, that was just tobacco. <laughs> uh, uh, did he say it in that time no, no but in my head i was like what i mean so jungle tobacco or mapacho is commonly smoked and actually that was the other thing that we were given we we're each given like a few uh tobacco straight kind of like blunt cigarettes um because it they see it as like it's another master plant, right? It's actually a really It's so weird one. to us, isn't it? Because we have such bad associations with tobacco. Exactly. Like every time I smell tobacco, I'm like, oh, it's disgusting. And, and like I propagandized as a child with all these, like people would come into our schools and show us like um, pictures of lungs that had been all, you know, and, affected by, t- like, it's just something that is so disgusting to me. But, Rightly so, because it's super dangerous. No, but, but what they say is that the jungle stuff, the actual, the, just the plant is not, it's the stuff that we grow over here or we get over here it's packed with chemicals and all of that stuff so that's, oh, that's that sounds argument. like bullshit it does sound like <laughs> bullshit but um i i don't it would be know interesting to, to compare it. their lung cancer stats sure but of course they probably don't have access to hospitals the way we do so their stats would be skewed but i mean obviously nicotine is i mean there are obvious there are other problems with cigarettes other than nicotine but nicotine is a big problem just on its own and they've got to have that in it right i don't know i thought they were separate oh I really don't know anything that I'm talking about. This is the thing. I I think, like, definitely research this because I don't think either of us know too much about the safety of jungle tobacco. (laughs) It's not our area of expertise. No, maybe we'll do an area on that and we'll just become rapid smokers. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, it was just... um, Another thing that I saw that night was the girl who'd had the the crazy trip on the second night, um, she... When she went up for her healing with Raul... I saw her transform into a black jaguar, which was it. I mean, obviously it's very dark. Um, Wait a minute, a mouse jaguar or a normal sized jaguar? <laughs> I would say it was somewhere between cat sized and um, small deer sized. Okay, and um, yeah, it's it's interesting how a lot of these themes like outer space, um, the jungle, animals, especially snakes and jaguars. I mean, you are literally in the jungle. I mean, that's true. Um, and it's true that less people seem to report that when we were in Amsterdam. But anyway, it's just, it seems very weird to me how a drug can make so many people see or experience the same things. Yeah, so that was really interesting to me because people kept telling me that I'd had a classic trip. Mm. I think you said that. Yeah, classic <laughs> trip. So I was like, well, what does classic mean? I mean, what? why are people having the same experiences? Are they even having the same experiences? It's a bit, it's a bit weird. Um... So I started like reading as many accounts as I could and I read loads in that ayahuasca reader and then just, you know, read it wherever I could find them and talking to people that I knew who'd taken ayahuasca. And there do seem to be some common themes, but I think it's kind of like with sleep paralysis. Uh, There are broadly similar, but the details vary quite a lot. So there's like, there's like a some base things that are going on but then they're interpreted through a lens of culture and expectations and you know individuals have different biases or whatever what sorry to interrupt but one of the ones that i remember was the for example i saw um a load of women on a cliff in my in the uh, amsterdam trip and that guy was reporting have seeing a lion on a cliff on a cliff yeah just like thinking like lion on a cliff that's very lion king oh yeah 
Well, so I mean, does it, yeah, they're always going to be. It does make you think. There are certain things that we see in films or that we ha- we hear in folk tales or whatever that you can see how they would like slip in. I mean, they slip into our dreams. So well, it makes sense that they'd also slip into our This is the collective, trips. collective unconscious, the uh, archetypes <laughs> of the world. <laughs> yes, or it could just be culture. Which and comes memes, from think... archetypes. <laughs> I think we talked, did we talk about memes in the sleep paralysis We did episode? a fair bit, yeah, yeah. So we or, may- or maybe a different one. So we, yeah, we won't go down that road again. Uh, but yeah, so I, and I, then it makes me think how it would be really interesting to look at commonalities between trips before and after the internet. Yeah, interesting. Because now if you want to do ayahuasca, obviously you give it a Google and you're confronted with loads and loads of other people describing their trips. Sure. So and we're going to be affected by those early trippers who went out and reported back, right? So I think if you read, I don't, I want to say, is it Huxley who did some ayahuasca? Um, uh, it could have been ayahuasca. It could have been one of those other ethnogens. Yeah. But I think I they did rem- a lot. I mean, they all did all yeah. the other things. But like, you know, if we read their accounts, again, we can't not be influenced by them and those people report back and influence us so yeah and then we have the other thing like i was saying we only talk to people who are selling ayahuasca and that's kind of like it gives us a selection bias for learning about the history of ayahuasca we also have a selection bias in that only interesting trips are recounted like no one's going to bother telling you that they had a boring trip and then once you've got these ideas about what you might see you're more likely to tell the story of your trip if it conforms to one of those things so you've got like the, all these weird things. But anyway, all that aside, that's like my caveat before I go into saying the themes that I've noticed. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first big theme I noticed, and this is a really obvious one, is the visuals. So obviously, almost everyone has hallucinations. These are hallucinogens. So that's unsurprising. But what is common is people seeing these patterns. Yes. Fractal-like patterns. Did you see? Did you see anything quite like that? Um, a, I think you did, didn't a, a, you? Especially in Amsterdam, that was like it was a On very. On that snake rich... you were describing sounded a bit. Yeah, I mean, my whole trip was incredibly visual at that time. Whereas in Dreamglade, it hadn't been so much. It had just been on that last night where it was really powerful. Um, and yeah, like almost traveling along the patterns, um, which also happened to kind of um, uh, connect with the music or that you're hearing. So uh, yeah. So this is a really common theme, seeing these, and there's reoccurring patterns. I I don't know if I mentioned this in the, um, we're talking about our trips in, in Amsterdam, uh, but I saw like, um, uh, uh, what are they called? Um, the lines on a map. Um, yeah. That, that tell you whether the mountains are going like up con- or down. Like contour lines. Contour lines, yes, that's what I was thinking of. Contour lines on an OS map, mm. um, but everything was black, and then I just saw those lines, and they were like lit up like uh, fluorescent lines mm. that I was I was traveling across. So it's interesting that that common thing of like traveling across a pattern and a pattern like going in front of your eyes. The common ones that people see are um, lattices, so like honeycombs, mm. checkerboards, yep. or triangles all slotted together, cobwebs, yep. tunnels and spirals yeah and listeners who are listening carefully will remember way way back when we talked about holotropic breathing we talked about the idea of form constants yeah um, which are these those are those exact four things lattices cobwebs tunnels and spirals and they're these patterns that it's been observed that humans see not just when they're tripping balls as you said (laughs) but in all sorts of states like um when people get uh very very fatigued sometimes these come up you see them just before you go to sleep or just before you wake up they're reoccurring things and what's cool about them is that they are a feature of the way that our eyes work so we map visual input from our eyes just light and it has to get into our visual cortex and how that happens um is complicated and i can't explain it very well but basically it's chemical and chemicals disperse at different rates so that causes patterns like perfectly symmetrical patterns as certain chemicals are whizzing out in different at different rates Mm -hmm. uh so it's basically like um a screensaver for the brain yeah when those those things are not in when those patterns are not inhibited um and we don't have any other stimulus that's what we see it's just a natural state of being human which i think is just so cool so why does ayahuasca bring that out more well no one really knows there's not there's not that much information i've been searching around trying to find more information and um maybe it's just my lack of scientific expertise that i can't understand some bits and bobs but it's 
it's basically the lack of stimulus is very important. And then they think that there's probably something to do with um, something in our brain that usually inhibits this yeah. happening. Yeah. And that's that's somehow turned off with certain drugs. That makes but yeah. sense. And the, the other thing it made me think is about people keep saying they're more real than real. They feel more intense than real reality. It's like, and I wonder whether that's because they're not mediated in the same way. Like, they're, we're not looking at something out there. This is like something that's, I don't know, quite haven't quite figured out what I think about that. But there's possibility for explaining why things look more real or more intense because they're, they're actually happening in our visual cortex are not happening out in the world. Um, and then this makes me think, like you were talking about the um, uh, nature and looking at all the leaves and things. And I think like, where do you see patterns like that? You see them in nature, you see them in fractals, you see them in leaves, you see them in shells, you see them in all those sort of things. And you also see them in machines. Mm. The clockwork, for example, you know, like clockwork, little things clicking elves. into each other. Yeah. So you can see why you would, you start with something quite simple, like that, just a pattern. And then, you know, the human imagination clicks into place and starts sort of elaborating from that. And that can go in all sorts of different directions, depending on what expectations you have. And as I said, your culture, all those sort of things. And what's really cool, though, is like you say, the synesthesia type mm. quality. And this again is so common. And I think it is because it comes up so many times, I think it must be one of those sort of very basic elements of the experience. It's like seeing sounds or, you know, s- smelling what you see. It's, it's that's what exactly. synesthesia is, it's mixing up senses. It's like, like sense confusion. Yeah, yeah. The first one, the earliest record anyway, was like in 1690. Uh, John Locke recorded that he met a guy who, when he heard trumpets, he saw red. Hmm. And and there are lots of people who are synesthetes and this is just a normal part of their daily experience. And in fact, some people don't even realise that it's unusual. They think everyone experiences things like this and they'll just see the number three and see blue because those two things are linked in their head. And again, it's a kind of really weird, mysterious thing about the brain. We don't really know why it happens. Uh, one theory is it's crosstalk. So it's like the auditory info is leaking over into your visual system or vice versa. Um, yeah, but no one really knows and that's I think that's one of the cool things about psychedelics and the more I read about them and the more I think these are a really interesting tool for understanding more about how our brains work yeah and it also made me that like talk about the Icaros and how beautiful they are you like I don't know whether you did you feel like you were s- sort of seeing the music at any um point? less so in Dreamglade more so in um Amsterdam so I mean I'd like to say that Icaros, like the traditional words are more important and more useful and effective. But I actually had a better experience, weirdly, with the kind of new age stuff that was being played on Spotify. <laughs> but so yeah, basically, yeah, I, I was, music works. The, yeah, I've tried to listen a couple of, in fact, I've kind of tried to make that habit um, of listening more carefully to music since these experiences, because mm. I want to have that same. And I, I feel like, um, maybe we can talk a bit more about this later, but that's something that I've taken away from the experience. Anyway, so the other things that I'm, I see keep cropping up is time dilation, like losing a sense of time or it seems like much longer than it has. Mm-hmm. I think it was one of the earliest people who was, um, Rick Straussman was doing experiments is with DMT. And this is in the documentary, The Spirit Molecule. Uh, these and they interview the people who were the original um, participants in these experiments and this guy is like he lives a whole lifetime basically and he sees the end of the world and he has this amazing experience and then they bring him back round or you know he opens his eyes takes off his blindfold and he's like how long have I been out and they Mm. say 15 minutes (laughs) and he's just like boom mind blown yes because for him and this is this again is a really common experience that time goes all weird Mm -hmm. and again this is cool because this is the reason why time goes weird is because our brains have to actively construct a sense of time as we have information coming in from all our senses and it's all sort of a mad jumble and our brain puts it together and gives us here's the present moment and when that's interfered with it makes time go screwy and there's all sorts of different illusions time illusions that can happen like oh something everyone will be familiar with if you walk a new route or drive a new route somewhere it seems to take longer yeah. And then when you drive it the second time, it takes shorter and eventually it seems like it takes no time at all. And they think that's something to do with um, you're paying more attention and you're putting, getting more data in. 
another cool thing is that awe, the sense of awe or wonder, slows down time. Huh. That's interesting. Don't really interesting. know why? Yeah. Just a mysterious thing about our brains. Time perception is a really low level process. So it's a bit horrible, but they've um taken out the entire cortex of rats and they can still estimate 40 seconds time passing. Weird. So it's a really low level thing that is obviously being fucked with somehow wow. using these using these drugs. Okay, next common experience is heightened emotions, mm. which I definitely <laughs> experienced. And they reckon this is to, to do with our serotonin type 2 system all being shook up, mm-hmm. basically. It's also the reason why we hallucinate, they think, maybe. So but what's strange about it is, at least, I don't know if this is a common experience, but it what it it made me think of is how my sadness came and it just had no context mm. and you always think emotions are about something that's the thing like they're ways of relating to the world i'm angry because that person pissed me off or i'm sad because i saw that sad movie or whatever but just to experience pure sadness it was really intense yeah 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 and uh, yeah so i don't know like that could be because the particular parts of my brain that make me sad were being prodded mm. but there was no no stimulus um and i wonder whether it's related somehow to the feeling of profundity you know like yeah that sense of knowing something because i think um i read this study a little while ago which basically said people with certain types of brain damage that means they have no emotions or very low emotions can't make decisions so like simple decisions like what to eat because there are pros and cons they, and they just can't weigh them. They become paralyzed. Yeah. Because we make a lot of those decisions just emotionally. Yes. Yes. So, oh, that's, that's so interesting. About making decisions and knowing something is right. That is an emotional thing. It's not just a, it's not a rational thing or it's not just a rational thing. It's an emotional thing. Mm-hmm. And then hearing again and again, people saying, I just sensed something was true. I sensed this was divine. I sensed I knew something about the world. And I think maybe that's an emotional thing. And that's and it's because our brain is being our emotions are being monkeyed with with the chemicals in our brain. And and sort of the story we tell ourselves is based on the emotion. The emotion doesn't come from the story. Yeah. Um this is very interesting. I mean, just as a sort of sidebar, I've been writing about beliefs and like what kind of goes into forming a belief recently and we've talked about lots of different things whether it's like uh you know factual input um different core drives and needs but the other one that was brought up to me um is our emotions which I'd completely forgotten about um but of course that affects how we believe something um and and you know yeah no that that's that's really interesting it's was something that I was worried about when we went into this experience because I was like I don't want to get I don't want, like you hear people saying, I just knew it was true. Yeah. And then you feel like you're at the end of the conversation because mm. how can you argue with that? They're just saying, I had this experience and I had an experience of truth. And so now I've concluded it is true. And I always thought, well, how can you just conclude something's true just because you feel like it's true? And I was worried that that might happen to me and that I might start having all these ideas about the world because I'd had this profound experience. And like, I didn't know... I'm, and because they're, I'm they're fine, but... and because they're irrational, you don't want to have those. Yeah, exactly. I don't want I I don't want my brain to start telling me things are true using an emotional or I'm not I didn't even think about it being emotional then, but using a different criteria than what I would use mm. and think is a good criteria like evidence, you know, and logic and reason and all those Hooey. all those things that I love so much. <laughs> but yeah, it occurred to me that profundity is something that like happens in our head. Um. So you'll be like looking around, looking at a field or whatever, and then you'll see a bird fly up and you'll be like, wow, that magpie, that magpie. Oh, it just feels really like there's something very intense about this experience. It's one of those um, heightened experiences. It feels spiritual. It feels like, look at it, it's so magnificent and off it flies and the sunlight glancing on its wings or whatever, you know. And what's happening is you're just looking around at completely ordinary things and then your brain, it's almost like a cognitive sneeze. Your brain is just going profound. Yes, profound. it's like I've heard somebody the other day and it was in a very spiritual context, but it was saying, you know, we don't give, um, meaning doesn't come from things. We give things meaning. And it, it feels yeah. like that. We kind of paint things with meaning. And if our emotions are like almost unnaturally turned up, we're going to find things more meaningful. And I think some people who <laughs> take a lot of drugs live like this, it seems. 
Yeah, that's got to be related as well to the music thing and the music. Like you, you, you've got the synesthetic quality, and then also this feeling that everything's super profound. I think it. I think that's all coming. That's all related to the emotional thing. Mm-hmm. So okay, my next thing is kind of what I experienced, I guess, or what people say is what I experienced, which is ego death mm. or ego dissolution, which is basically just a loss of subjective self identity. And I think we kind of talked about this a bit in the meditation episode as well, because people say that they experience this during meditation, and I thought I'd experienced it in meditation, um, and maybe I did have little, you know, glimpses of it, but this was. This was unlike anything I'd experienced. It was just so much longer, for one thing. Um, so people describe layers of self disappearing, mm-hmm. which is more or less exactly what I felt, and just losing track of what you are, and sort of either dissolving into everything, or just everything going away and there being nothing, which is closer to what I had. And again, this is another thing that tells us something interesting about the brain or confirm something interesting about the brain, which is the sense of self is something our brains have to work to do. It's not just yeah. it's not just how we are. Our brains are working to do it. And if you damage those parts of the brain or turn them off or inhibit them, then that sense of self gets lost. Mm. And combine that with a feeling that's very common, or maybe these are related actually, um, the feeling of floating or losing sense of where your limbs are in space. Uh, you're like proprioception is all screwed up. It can just feel like, there's nothing to you and you know you are nothing and everything is meaningless <laughs> yeah and it's so interesting because yeah lots of people have that experience even in meditation but they see it as a positive thing or they f- yeah it can go it can kind of go either that. way exactly it's it's really interesting i think it's really similar to dissociation which is something that i've had bouts of before uh, i had this really weird f- experience where i was just standing I was just going through an emotionally difficult time in my life and I was, you know, it was just a high stress time. Mm. I was dealing with other mental health stuff as well. And um, I was standing at a bus stop and I looked at my reflection in the bus stop across the other side of the road and I just did not recognize it. I was like, oh, there's a woman. Oh, she's wearing my clothes. And then it was like clicked, like it felt like a long time before it clicked. That's me. Mm. And that kind of, I don't know whether that's what started the dissociative thing or whether that was just like, you know it was a signal that it was happening but I've had them on and off throughout my life and it's 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 unpleasant it feels risky especially if you're doing something like driving Mm. um (laughs) you just don't really feel like you're in your body I don't it's a really hard thing to describe but it's definitely similar but not as intense as what I had and maybe this is I mean to be fair they did ask us in that survey do you have any history of mental health problems? And I just said, no, because <laughs> <laughs> I want to do the drugs. <laughs> but um, but yeah, something to be aware of maybe if you do suffer from dissociation or have had th- that, that experience before, be more careful, maybe consider not doing it, but who am I to tell you not to do it since I went ahead and did. So there's a, I read a study and a couple of studies um, sort of trying to describe what's going on psychologically during ego dissolution. And uh, I have a quote for you. Let's see if you can get your head around this. A biphasic polarized emotional structure is often reported in an ayahuasca experience. No idea what any Mm. of those words mean. Yeah. Yeah. I had to reread this paper so many times before I got it. It basically means it gets really shit. It gets so shit that somehow it flips over and becomes wonderful. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Which a lot of people do talk about. Yeah. Exactly. They call it deconditioning and reintegration. So you're like reversing, you have to go through all the negative stuff and like clear it out and then put yourself back together with only positive stuff. Interesting. I mean, and you hear that so much just in any, like a lot of spiritual work, you know, you have to go through to come out. You know, you have <laughs> yeah, to. I, I think there's something to it, although I it makes me think of um, catharsis. Everyone says it's really good to like... Um, you know, let out your emotions. And then there was some um, research recently that suggested that actually, if you go like shouting and screaming every night to get out all your anger, you're just sort of programming yourself to be more angry. No, I can see that. Yeah, you're just practicing being angry. So I don't know how, how much weight to give that, but it is a very common experience. And this is really similar. I mean, they call ayahuasca the vine of death. Have you heard Mm -hmm, that? Yep. So these experiences are very similar to NDEs, near death experiences. Mm -hmm. Uh, you've got the tunnels because of the um, 
because of that uh, visual thing that's going on. In fact, your your snake was kind of tunnel like, wasn't it? Yep. So that's the form constant. So you've got the tunnels. That's the same as NDEs. The feeling of a loss of self and the, all that. There are also some like physical responses. Like um, I didn't mention this much, but like my heart tends to beat very fast. And like at Dreamglade, I'd get like locked jaw quite a lot. Um, and things like that make you feel like I always have the sense that I'm, I've poisoned myself and I might die. Yeah. So it very is like the NDE thing is it's very real, not just on a, a kind of uh, what you're seeing, but also what you're feeling. Yeah, there's this guy, Christopher Timmerman, who did a study on it in 2018. Um, I read a great blog about it from um, Stephen Novella on Neurog- Neurological. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, but they basically um, uh, gave people DMT, recorded their experiences in quite a you know, um, scientific way, exact way, and then compared it to a, to a criteria of near-death experience and found a massive overlap. Mm-hmm. It's a very, very similar experience. Also makes me think of um, alien abduction stories. Yeah. Especially when you're talking about those little entities that come along. Yeah. And that's that's the next thing that I've got, the last common theme that I've noticed. I've just said, I've got written in my notes, other entities, because they're so varied. <laughs> uh, but I think this is, what's going on is when you lose your sense of self and you're still having thoughts, you have to like figure out where those thoughts are coming from. And people often think, um, this is like an idea kicked around by psychologists, that maybe um, people were hearing voices, um, like schizophrenics, for example. Or it's not just a schizophrenic thing. I mean, as you point out, we all hear voices to some extent. But that could actually be caused by disassociation Hmm. because you're not... So your thoughts are still coming up, but they don't seem to be like your thoughts because you're disassociated from yourself. So in an ayahuasca experience, if you have lost your sense of self, of course you don't think your thoughts are your own because there is no you. Yeah. And then once you think that your thought is coming from someone else, you start ascribing that someone else all sorts of characters and appearances, whether that's, you know, your ancestors or dead loved ones, that's very common. And that's what that guy was talking about meeting his dad. Mm. Um, or the elves. Da, da, da. <laughs> da, da, da. Yeah, machine elves. That's what they were originally called by Terence McKenna. Um, and he described them as merry elfin, self-transforming machine creatures. Uh, but everyone talks about them. I mean, and again, this is it's a meme because everyone talks about them. People are more likely to see them and then it just sort of feeds itself. Uh, yeah. It reminded me of like people used to talk about. In fact, when I was young, uh, when I was not super young, when I was a teenager, um, I worked at a head shop where we sold mushrooms. And um, we it was like some loophole in the legality. Should we sell them? So we're all doing mushrooms all the time or not all the time, but not unregularly because we got a staff discount uh, and my friend did some and he saw little fairies and things and this was a very common experience with mushrooms as well which is not unsurprising because it's a very similar chemical compound to dmt but he was like wandering through this you know the woodlands of england uh on mushrooms and he saw these little um they just sort of popped up either side of the path these little dwarves or gnomes i can't remember what you call them but little diminutive creatures and they started singing to him wow and i even i remember what they sang because it was hilarious they sang jeff jeff covered in jam jeff jeff covered in jam 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 covering jeff his name was jeff obviously oh that's so funny and he obviously had jam on his mind so this idea of like little little people being about It's something that goes back, I mean, we have legends of elves and fairies and, you know, this is something that people have seen for a long time. And I don't know entirely why. I mean, it's one of those, it could just be a meme, it could just be culture, but there is this um, uh, thing, it's like a horrible disease or condition anyway, where you go slowly blind. It's called Charles Bonnet syndrome. Oh, wow. And that also causes you to see diminutive figures. And they think it's something to do with, uh, like, your eyes shutting down and they... um, I don't know, something about it, it shuts down from the outside in. So you, your peripheral vision goes and you start seeing weird shapes and you you think they're little people. I could be completely wrong. It's worth giving mm. Charles Bonnet syndrome a Google. But yeah, so this is a thing that our brains do. If we see little shapes, we think they're little people. Sure. And, and then you can imagine how that gets you to fairies or grey aliens or all sorts of things. Yep. Um, and you've got Alex Jones to Clockwork Elves. Mm-hmm. Uh, which he talked about on the Joe Rogan podcast earlier this year. And he, I think, is the first person who's proposed, or at least the first person I've heard propose, that they are evil. Yeah. 
which is which is troubling and that there are good like s- spirits like this but they don't appear to us so often yeah i don't know where he's got this idea from i suspect it's probably because he's christian oh i was gonna so th- thought like schizo or something but yeah like it's it's quite well, uh, that's also quite possible yeah. but, um but yeah like if you're christian then like strange spirits coming and talking to people it's an unusual or demons or something right you're gonna ascribe um, good or bad to them yeah oh i listened to that episode of joe rogan's podcast before we went to amsterdam and um the he said uh i mean you can go listen to it for yourselves you probably haven't listened to it it's a much more popular podcast than ours (laughs) but um he said that that's the problem that happened with the aztecs and the mayan society they started they were doing religious ceremonies with ayahuasca and they started listening to what the clockwork elves were telling them and they tell them to do human sacrifices and basically destroyed that whole civilization. I suspect it was more colonialism that destroyed their civilization. <laughs> but, you know, it could also be clockwork elves, I suppose, and, from another dimension. And that, isn't this how, like, you know, big world leaders are kind of making their decisions? They're sitting in yes. re- meeting rooms and talking to these, uh, calling on the clockwork elves. That's what he thinks. But you didn't experience them as negative, did you? No, but they were neutral but I still trusted them to do the belly work stuff. So, you know. Yeah, I'm not sure I'd trust them to rummage around. In my <laughs> I don't know what they <laughs> left in there. <laughs> There's actually a great um, poem that I read in the Ayahuasca Reader that's kind of relevant to the um, the that experience of them working on you, because this is a common experience, and it's not common enough for me to put it down as one of my basic experiences. But the idea that uh, little, it doesn't even need to be, but someone's coming in and healing you and physically yes. like cutting you open, um, all that stuff. Yeah, this is by Stephen F. White. I really like it. It goes like this The skilled physicians come as birds. They open me with their heads like scissors and devour the insects teeming in my spine. There is a tempest of wings when they finish. All that remains are bits of exoskeleton, and I, antennae, some feathers, and a new life that I thought would be impossible. Hmm. I really like that. Yeah. I, you know I'm a poetry nut. but <laughs> Plus there were birds in it, which, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Also love birds. So the other common entity people see is, like you saw as well, Mother Ayahuasca. Mm-hmm. What a Did treat. You, you didn't see her when you were in Peru, though. No, I didn't. So that's interesting because she's, she's often associated with the Amazon itself. Yeah. But she didn't come to you in Peru. No. I think this is, I mean, this is super obvious. This is like... Um, armchair psychology 101 why why would people fantasize about a mother figure hmm so difficult to figure out tell us freud there's this this great book uh religion for atheists by alan de botton Mm -hmm. and he talks about all the basically all the positive things that religion gives us and suggests ways to sort of extract them from religion so that secular people can enjoy them and one of the things he talks about is the need for tenderness and the need to be taken care of. And it's just basically like a, a childhood need. Like we still, some part of us still longs to be held and comforted. And he, his theory is that's why we have Mother Mary and all the other goddesses, probably not Carly, but all the other, you know, loving goddesses who cuddle us. Um, because we still we still desperately want a mother, some part of us that is is still in that child mode, which I think is really sweet. Yeah. And it makes It makes perfect sense that people would, if you're going to come up with anything, for from this experience any other entity than a mother goddess makes perfect sense Absolutely. i really wish i'd seen her it would have really helped <laughs> you just need to take ayahuasca again that's all <laughs> um so yeah this is the, i mean this is just um it's a it's a very innate thing about human beings we all we all attribute um that kind of maternal feeling to all sorts of things um and the theory is, I mean, the sort of um, what's going on in the brain is that we have theory of mind, which means we can realize that other people are thinking and we assume that they're thinking quite similar to us and we make guesses about what they're going to do next and what they're thinking. That's obviously incredibly useful for interacting with other human beings, um, which develops, you know, I mean, it's fully kicked in by about five years old, but before, like when ki- when babies are babies, they don't really see a distinction between self and other they don't understand that people have other minds that's something that sort of slowly clicks up and that kind of michael Shermer, um in his book why people believe weird things describes it as agenticity being able to attribute agenthood to other things but it there's it's just hyperactive 
in almost all people um, because there's nothing that selects against it. So it's really good to be able to guess what other people are thinking. Mm. And it doesn't cost you much if you also think, well, wait a minute, maybe the sun's thinking something or maybe this rock's thinking something. And that's how you get animism. Right. Because there's nothing we're always us. looking for... Exactly. We're always looking for agency. It doesn't hurt to think that rocks are conscious, so people do. So my speculation is like this idea of other entities, the combined thing of like being dissociated and still having thoughts, that's weird. And then also everyone just assumes anything they see and that you hear many accounts of this of all sorts of psychedelics. Um, yeah, you see something like a tree and then you end up having a conversation with it. The conversation is between you and your own thoughts, but you don't recognize your own thoughts. And because we have this agenticity thing going on in our brain, it makes it seem like the tree's alive. And that all those little um, brain mechanisms click in to create these amazing experiences where we can talk to nature and we can talk to a pine cone and we can talk to whatever, you know? I, I, I really find this fascinating. I mean, you've definitely stripped some of the, all of the magic, I'd say, out of <laughs> the possible spiritual experience of meeting Mother Ayahuasca. Um, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's, it's funny because they said that in the spirit molecule, they were very um, uh, sort of pissed off, I think. I mean, in the nicest sort of hippie way about science. And they were like, you know, science is... Um, it's just trying to explain our experiences away or scientists are trying to discount our experiences as hallucination. And I'm like, well, why do you assume that hallucinations are bad? Mm. And why do you assume or that they're not as good or that they have no value? And why do you assume that just because I'm talking in terms of brain chemicals that I don't think that's beautiful and valuable because actually I really do. I think it's like just the terminology and like maybe I think it's, I think it is really cool that I've got this thing let's call it, it might be in my brain, um, but whatever it is, it's generating this amazing world that I can go into. Um, and whether, where, I don't care where that thing comes from, it's still, um, it's it still is real because I'm perceiving it. It's as real as anything. I mean, yeah, experiences are real. Right. They're, they're not real in the way of like, they're not real like this table is, but you really had that experience. Exactly. I've, it exists it's funny in my mind. It's like, they seem to be saying, unless you admit that Mother Ayahuasca is an actual goddess who actually exists outside our own brains in the real world, then she doesn't count. And I'm like, well, who sounds like a materialist now? Right. Like, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. think she has to be material to count or to say important things about people yes. or to be valuable to people. But you seem to be saying she does. And yet I'm the one who's like a grumpy materialist. I don't get you guys. <laughs> Drop the mic. <laughs> don't get them at all. Um, so yeah, should we talk about potential harms and benefits? Sure. Yes. Um, yeah. So I mean, obvious ones are um, dangerous situations, right? Um, and I think it's interesting that, I mean, relatively speaking, there haven't been that many mainstream horror stories, um, but you you do hear of them, and it's not to do so much with. I mean, you can divide them up into when when the the drug is the problem what whatever somebody drinks is let's say killing somebody or harming them in, a, in another way or the people involved and um when it comes to just the drink as far as i know unless you've got some um heart defect or are on another um drug it's it's safe right yeah they say that the lethal dose is like 50 times the amount you normally take in a ceremony i can't imagine being able to drink 50 times what we drank right i mean like it would just be physically impossible so i think the the risk of consuming a lethal dose of dmt in an ayahuasca ceremony is i mean there it's like no point no 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 one yeah it's it's very very unlikely and that's the same for a lot of psychedelics in fact you know that guy um david nuts yes he was i saw him talk at my university He's a cool dude. Um, he was an advisor to the UK government on drug law. And he was basically the guy who said, our drug laws are insane. They're just really arcane and vague and bizarre. And we should just rework them and classify them by quantifying the actual potential harm of the drugs. Yeah. So he drew up some parameters and he made up a list. It's like 10 years ago and it was big news, wasn't it? Yeah. And In fact, it was probably around the time you saw him at university. Yeah, I think so. So by based on his parameters, alcohol and tobacco were more harmful than LSD, yep. ecstasy, or cannabis. Exactly. Uh, which was not a very popular conclusion yeah. with the government, and uh, he was dismissed, yeah. unfortunately. Really sad. Do you want to guess the top five most dangerous drugs um, on his list? Uh, so uh, alcohol, smoking, uh, caffeine. 
We've got alcohol came in at number five. Huh. Uh, tobacco isn't on the top five. Okay. The top one is kind of obvious. It's heroin. heroin. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Number two is cocaine. cocaine. Okay, yeah. Number three is barbiturates. I'm not even sure what that really is, right. to be honest. Um, uh, number four is methadone. Okay, then, then fair alcohol. enough. Yeah. Uh, tobacco comes in at number nine. Mm-hmm. Cannabis comes in at number number eleven, and LSD is way down there at number fourteen. Hmm. And things like, uh, unfortunately, the other drugs we've been talking about, peyote and um, ayahuasca, and they're not even on the list. I guess that wasn't did, on people's radar. Did he put DMT ago. on the list? No, it's not. On oh, there. interesting. I guess it wasn't popular enough to be considered, or it fell off the bottom of the list. Wow, I don't wow, know. really interesting. Well, I mean, we our brains do produce DMT, so there's that. Um, well, you didn't. Know I th- don't know if that's true. It is the pituitary glands produces it i'm i'm not entirely i'm i know that they found very very small amounts of dmt in our body but i think it's kind of i think it's one of those mysterious things a lot of people say a lot of things about where it's produced and what it does but no one really knows for sure okay i don't know something to give a google (laughs) that's your, your homework project listeners tell us whether dmt is really produced in the brain and where exactly it's produced and what it does um, and then there are the people involved. So I think this is where the, the horror stories are more common, right? So it might be yeah. a brujo. Um, there's there's a thing called toei, um, which is a, a sort of it's similar to ayahuasca, but it's kind of like a date rape drug, or it can be used in that way. And yeah, I've heard yeah, about you this. hear about people being given that instead. Um, so stay away from the brujos. Uh, and well, that's easy to say, but I wouldn't know a brujo from a legit shaman. <laughs> well, exa- well, you have to be able to sense them. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, then you, I guess you could be indoctr- indoctrinated into a, a cult, which I haven't had a lot of until I was getting some hints, um, again, in this Facebook group where a member was posting about his first ayahuasca experience, which was held in, I think it was upstate New York, or maybe it's just in New York. Um, anyway, it's it's a place called the Golden Drum, and he was saying how, like, is it normal that my facilitators would stop the music to kind of talk about various subjects, including their guru? Um, and, mm. you know, they were reading from their phone. And it, it basically sounded just like a crappy ceremony because who wants somebody stopping it to talk? I think that would have been really disturbing because whenever the music stopped, really disturbed me. Um, yeah, apparently you're very suggestible. That's one of the I'll things bet. people say about ayahuasca and psychedelics in general. You become very suggestible, um, which is why probably you end up seeing the things you do. So that's if you're a cult leader, that's a good trick. Yeah, and somebody else said, "Oh, that golden drum. They're they're a cult." Um, this guy founded it, Manuel Rafino, um, who seems to kind of peddle everything from shamanism, Hinduism, um, something called. He's claiming to be of the Taino descent, so T-A-I-N-O, um, but apparently there isn't any real evidence of this. I don't know. I don't see any like massive red flags here, but I do know that <laughs> a lot of the members... I, I see a few. But, <laughs> but okay. I, I do know that a lot of the members live in uh, live communally um, in Brooklyn. So anyway, it's, it's interesting to know that people like that are um, hosting these ceremonies. And um, I mean, my thought, especially when I went to Peru was I think it's going to be safer in Peru which is a bit weird but that was what I was telling myself why were you think why were you thinking that because I thought this is where the 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 real deals will come from they're less motivated by um like western you know like we want to make they would be less inclined to just want to make money from me. And I don't know. It was just a story. I don't think it's true now. I, th- I think you can have a perfectly safe experience anywhere or a p- perfectly dangerous experience anywhere. But at the time, that was the sense I got. I think that's actually one of the problems um, and one of the reasons why people are really vulnerable to abuse when they're going to these sort of things is because we have this idealized vision of the ayahuasca or yeah. whatever, curandero, as divine and as like knowing, you know, and being perfect. Yeah. And therefore, we're much more likely to just go along with whatever they say or do because they're the shaman. Yes. And that can be super dangerous. There have been like accounts of um, traditional shamans and Western neo-shamans and leaders in the Santa Diem church have all been accused of sexual assault. Yeah. And it's common enough that there's like people in the ayahuasca community, whatever that means, like trying to make people aware of it. We have no stats on this, unfortunately. So we don't know how common it is, but it's common enough that people are aware it's a problem. 
there's lots of warnings out there to female travelers not to go alone and always to make sure that you know you have a man with you and all these in fact i'll put in the show notes there's a great um, community guide for awareness of sexual abuse that some people have produced which gives you like suggestions for how to protect yourself and things and then obviously the other side of it is working to to stop people sexually assaulting people Mm. uh but yeah, there's some really horrible stories and you can see how it happens because if you think about it, like you might be in unfamiliar surroundings, you might be isolated. Obviously, you're physically weak or completely immobilized yeah. in some cases, sleep deprived. You've got the suggestibility element. Also, a lot of people have sexual visions, so they actually feel kind of horny when they're going through the ayahuasca thing, which makes everything very complicated and confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's some really horrible um, stories I've read of personal accounts of women who've been abused. And it just made me think how how vulnerable we were there and how... Because when I played back our recording of um, the, the recording we made immediately after our experience, or not immediately, but you know what I mean, um, to Paul, he was very upset by it. He was upset by the fact that I, he felt and I guess I was like I was coerced into taking the second cup. Yeah, and he found that really troubling. Uh, I think that like, is true, and I was, yeah, yeah. I think that is a real big, big problem with that. What happened there, and um, similarly at this other place where I felt kind of like guilty about the not purging, but like that's less dangerous than forcing somebody. It really did feel like we were being forced, and it would take yeah. a lot of will to say no. I think this is a general um, problem. I It's kind of been brewing for a while. I've been thinking about it. But like when we go into these new age space, spaces, we're often immediately getting hugged and touched. And there's no asking you if you're okay with that. Right. Or it's very often no people just start talking about very intense emotional things. And it's almost considered like uncool or like you're blocked or like yes. you're not... I don't if know, you hold back from something. isn't flowing right. If you, yeah. So I can see very easily how that would become a problem and would become a great ground for a predator to operate in. Yeah. Because if you're inhibited, if you're not taking off your clothes, that's often apparently people are asked to take off their clothes. Women are asked to take off their clothes by the shaman at, um, at retreats. And that's, and you know, that's, <laughs> that's not something you have to do. Um, it's not normal, but you'll you'll go along with it because there's the social pressure yes. and there's the feeling like they know what they're doing and humans conform that's what we do we know this yeah. this has been proven enough times in enough extreme ways yeah so we talked a lot on all sorts of different shows about cults and um how they operate and and i definitely see like i can i can feel how these communities that we're just getting we're just entering into for like one or two experiences i can see how that it's dangerous it's a it's a it's a predator it's a predator playground yeah or could be um and i think people don't talk about that enough um and uh, yeah i don't i don't know exactly what to do about it but like we talk about consent culture in normal life when you're not in the hip in the hippies dens you talk about consent culture and making sure that it's cool that you touch people and it's you know just checking people's boundaries and being respectful of people's boundaries and that is something that does not seem to have filtered into the new age world yet no um th- there's the other danger um about kind of going insane right yeah um because this is also quite common and i've heard like direct um accounts of this a place i stayed at uh, not to do ayahuasca they had done one once and it was private mostly around friends and friends of friends um but one guy uh he said he'd done it like a hundred times before but after that Whoa. experience yeah, I mean, he said that. After that experience, he basically seems to have gone, um, I would say it, probably schizophrenia. Um, he had, you know, delusions of um, grandeur being the son of God. Uh, and also um, blackmailing these people, these lovely people, and many other people, including the facilitator who was not associated with the group, um, for massive sums of money, um, saying that it was kind of like their penance he didn't really say I don't think what they did wrong but it was like they had to pay penance to the son of God by giving him lots of money and they have he's basically tormented these people you know leaving him them horrible reviews on Google but has since deleted them did they give were they the ones who gave him ayahuasca a hundred times no 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 they've only okay because that's good if, if that was the case they kind of had it come they only did this ceremony um this is the first and only time they've done it uh and it was just like 
a horrible horrible story and like same with Dreamglade they've had at least like one guy who's reported back being like you know I I'm having a really hard time um and you in most cases in fact I'm pretty sure in every case these people are already um predisposed to having some kind of mental issue and I can understand how the ayahuasca triggers that I can I can definitely yeah, understand this it. is Again, we talked about this in me- in the meditation episode. Like, is it something that already exists that's just being sort of provoked by by the drug or by the uh, the hardcore meditation practice, or is it something that's generated? Yeah, by by, by doing it a lot, the thing itself, or it, just doing yeah, it once. I, I mean, it can happen just from once, not one time. I would say that, like, my thought when I was uh, in the last ceremony, thinking, "Oh man, if I did this a lot, or even once more." Um, would this would I get locked in this world? That is the feeling you get often during the experience. But afterwards, yeah, that's you do... very similar to what I felt yeah. or what was worried about. Yeah, yeah. It seems it's interesting that the the way in which people seem to go mad is quite similar to the way in which people who have a bad experience with meditation go mad. It's all that depersonalization, derealization, things looking unreal, psychosis, seeing patterns everywhere. Yeah, like. It, like that suggests to me again that it must be something vaguely similar going on in the brain but it, i mean there are examples of this but it does seem quite rare i read much more about sexual abuse than i did about people going mad right well that's uh good news i guess um <laughs> yeah it's not very comforting <laughs> um the other thing is just kind of like paying too much money right like i don't want to be ripped off by anyone and i read that um you know, ayahuasca probably costs about 15 quid a pop. You know, it's it's not an expensive thing to get these plants, even though they are probably um, at risk of being over farmed, who knows. Um, but we, I paid $130 a day at Dreamglade and we paid $200 for the uh, Amsterdam experience, which it's not super high. That would I would say that these are some of the lower price ranges. I think there are many... Yeah, we went, we shopped around yes. for the one in Amsterdam. Yeah, and I think... Um, uh, many experiences you know you might be doing a three-day experience and it might be two grand like it's just kind of crazy crazy sums of money in dream glade was that the um your accommodation was included everything in your... great food okay. great food great accommodation i mean that was a bargain um and i couldn't find anything that cheap either at the time So we'd recommend that yes, one. Yes, <laughs> just just <seal> of approval. <laughs> just uh, just um, on a pure. And- uh, the other the other thing it's not really a a risk, but the other thing that people talk about a lot on like downsides is how ayahuasca tourism is affecting people in Peru. Sure. Did you think about that or talk to anyone about that? Oh whilst you God, were there? no. I think it's giving people jobs and things to do. Like I can't be convinced otherwise on that. Yeah, I'm <laughs> I'm intent- I'm inclined to go the same way. I think there's like, I mean, but I think that I about think, tourism like, anyway. Yeah, I think we can't dehumanize indigenous people. They have a right to sell their whatever they want to us. Like we can't tell them it's wrong for them to sell ayahuasca to us. And that that that's a very strange yeah. worry. And Although I do obviously tourism affects cultures, but it's their choice whether they invite tourists in. And I mean, but then again, the people who like the normal people who are not fans of ayahuasca have to put up with all the tourists. Yeah, but I don't know. I, I mean, the other thing is I've I've watched one documentary where. Um, a Shipibo man was saying, well, I'm glad that the the white man is coming in to, you know, um, do this with us because otherwise the culture, this tradition would be getting lost because our kids are not taking it up. They're going into the cities and leaving their traditions behind. So stuff like that makes me think maybe it's not so bad. Yeah, although it's not really keeping up the same traditions because the, like we were saying about the different ways in which people have used ayahuasca in the past and different psychedelics all across South America, the way that they used it traditionally to do sorcery and to do divination and to do um, shape shifting, we haven't even really talked about that much, but that's a big thing, like imagining that you are an animal. Um, that's not really what's going on in modern ayahuasca ceremonies because they're selling it to Western people who have different ideas, ideas about like, you know, self-development, well, and self-realization. That, no, and all that I would say that healing and, and working with a plant for healing purposes is traditional. That's true. Healing does seem to be a traditional part, but there's lots of stuff, especially the bits that aren't so um, what's the that aren't so nice. I've just got left aside, which is probably for the best, I guess. But it's an it's like a trope you often see when you like 
uh, we go in, we, the Westerners, go into another culture and we just, we paint them as like noble savages and everything they do is perfect and wonderful and they're very simple, spiritual people. And that's not true. There's a lots of, like you say, brujos or whatever. <laughs> they're as complicated as we are and some of them aren't very nice and some of them use their ayahuasca to do, like, for warfare, that's quite common, like, to get psyched up to go to war, they would take it. Yeah, because it enhances so your we're... senses, yeah. Exactly, we're just taking the bits that, that like us and then we change the the traditions like we're continuing them but we're also changing them i think it's it's complex but i think i think to say that it is all bad is ridiculous yeah. obviously there is some good in it and there's some bad just like everything um and finally there's you know going to prison um because yeah that's a downside <laughs> i'd say uh, the presence of dmt um it, basically like in the usa as far as i know um because of the DMT, it, it isn't legal, but the legal way is to kind of say that you're um, associated with one of the two Brazilian-based churches, the Santo Daime and the you know, uh, Uneo do Vegetal, the UDV, right? <laughs> Union of the Plants is what that stands for. Yeah. And then in Canada, I think both DMT and Harmaline, they're classified as Schedule 3 drugs, meaning you can go to prison for three years. Um, however, you can still purchase the plants to make ayahuasca. Uh, Italy and Spain, no specific law. Um, it, it's it's so different everywhere. And like in the UK, the plants are not banned, but DMT is banned. So the resulting drink is illegal. That's the same thing with mushrooms. That's how we got around selling them um, back in the day. I don't know what the laws are like now, but back in the day when um, I was at university and was working in that head shop, it was illegal to prepare them, but it wasn't illegal to just have the mushrooms and there was always this debate about whether it was okay for us to keep them in the fridge whether mm. that counted as preparing um yeah but the uk drug laws are just such a mess yeah and i think they are pretty illegal now you know you, you can't what about buy. the netherlands so Since that's yeah where you did them. um it seems to be legal to possess and use ayahuasca though there have been some cases of ayahuasca related arrests um mm. yeah it's really interesting um I found a good document that's like, uh, is ayahuasca legal in your home country? I'll put a note in the show notes. So if you're interested in finding out what exactly the laws are in your country, that will give you a guide. But it does seem like a lot of these laws are just super vague. Yeah, yeah. Um, and da, 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 I, I guess that those are pretty much the only dangers I can think of. <laughs> only that long <laughs> list we just went through. <laughs> So do you think you'd do it again? Um, at the time, and I thought this, uh, on at least two of my ceremonies, uh, no. But uh, now, yes. So Really? Yeah, yeah. So I don't know why. It's just, it seems to like, the more I learn about it, the more I love it. Like just as a, that it's that it's happening and like the, the power of it and how I feel afterwards. You know, after you think you're going to die and lose your mind and you realise that you don't. It's pretty nice. Um. I, I'd love to send you to that um, clinic in um, Kentucky, the, the documentary, I, the Vice so, documentary was about. Yes, I, I really like the bloke who ran it. So uh, yeah, I'd be up for that. <laughs> but I, I would... <laughs> you could be our roving reporter because Kat's travelling around America at the moment. Yes. Um, I would say, oh yeah, and I'm in a state where weed is legal, which is, um, that's a nice thing. Nice. Anyway, so uh, recommendations though. I would say that if anyone is totally unfamiliar with any hallucinogen... Or any, I mean, any psychoactive drug. Let's say, um, don't do it. I think smoke some weed, take some truffles or mushrooms first, um, and see how you do when your consciousness is um, altered so much. Uh, and I think that's really good advice. And the whole classic set and setting. Thing. Man, it's it's big. Yeah, right. And I felt very safe in the particular places that I went, but I could equally have not. And would I have left? Probably not. So. Yeah, really reading reading reviews, like lots and lots of reviews. And there's a place called, ah, uh, well, I'll put it in the show notes, but it's either Aya Reviews or something like that, where you can find out all of the different places. Um, so that's kind of, that's the setting half, like yes. what, what the place is like that you're going. This is Timothy Leary's um, saying, set and setting. And the set is mindset, yes. like the mindset you go into it with. And I wonder whether, because I was so anxious before I went in, to the experience in Amsterdam maybe that's part of the reason why I had such a um well unless it wasn't necessarily unpleasant but I had the experience I did yeah and the other thing I'd say is you know 
try getting more serious with meditation and maybe trying holotropic breath work first as well because again it's it's how can you um how does your mind respond to these kind of different states um and yeah don't pay too much money we've kind of given you a rough guide i wouldn't say paying more than 200 dollars a day um is a good idea uh, no. <laughs> and and do it more than once but take a day off in between so places that make you do it one day after another i don't think is sensible so but why should they do it what's like we talked a bit about integration like what have you got from this experience what's the what's the up but we've just gone through a big list of dangers what's what's the upside what have you got from it i mean it, it definitely there are a lot of like kind of It's, it's, yeah, I'm giving you an opportunity to sell something. No, out. for sure. But but geez, it's so personal. And it's like, it's not going to give you, you might think there is something that you want to work on, but it's probably going to give you something else. Like last time my message was, like I said, trust myself, trust my body, my like physical uh, self. Um, other times it's just like a sense of love. Like that's what I got on my third experience at Dreamglade. Um, and just like good vibes. And also just, this weird thing afterwards where I remember reporting back to you after after Peru how I felt like less addicted to things so like let's say there's a cookie I felt more self-control about not having the cookie and they there have been studies to show that ayahuasca can be used to help with addictions um there's certainly some people giving it a go and another big thing is ibogaine have you heard that's of that? even bigger for addiction and and a less pleasant yeah. experience like you're less likely to have a good time on ibogaine but it's powerful yeah yeah, apparently it's absolutely horrible. You can feel like you can't move and it's much more dangerous as well. Yes, than, um, for your heart. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the, on Wikipedia it says 19 people have died between two, 1990 and 2008, which Jeez. basically doesn't mean anything because out of how many. Yeah. But the fact that they have reports of people dying, which I don't think they have just from taking ayahuasca, although they might, obviously there have been people who have died in related circumstances. And that's really worrying. That's the guy, you, we started the podcast talking about Gabor Mate. Yes. And he's the one who is really pushing, well not pushing, but you know, um, a proponent of ibogaine as a as a way to recover from drug addiction mm. he, that's his specialist area uh, he reckons i read his book um in the realm of hungry ghosts years and years ago and his thesis is basically like addiction is a solution to endorphin deficiency which is generally in his view caused by childhood trauma so something happens to you when you're a kid it fucks you up and it makes you not feel good and then you go around searching for something that makes you feel good and you find drugs or whatever else you're addicted to and you can't stop doing them because it's the only thing that makes you feel normal makes you feel human i i don't know i i didn't really read it with a skeptical eye back then but i loved his the sense of compassion mm. he had for the addicts he worked with it was really beautiful um so he reckons that um i began uh basically it gives you endorphins. It does something, makes you be more receptive to endorphins or something, which makes everything great for three months, which is enough time to break through, get yeah. your shit together. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. I, I don't know. Again, like there are studies, but they're all so small and the controls are terrible. So it's just like, we don't really know the science on this, but people are, people are trying it. Uh, what I don't like though, is this kind of, it reminds me a bit of AA, you know, AA, so they say it works if you work. So work it. Yeah, and, we're, and the converse is that is so if it doesn't work, it's kind of your fault, which seems a bit harsh. Well, it's also encouraging people to take personal responsibility, which I don't think is a bad thing. You know, don't. That's it's, it's, true. It's There's not a... saying like you just need to pop a pill and you'll be solved. It's like, no, I think we should be taking some personal responsibility about our state of well-being, and that can be really empowering. Yeah, it's it's complicated. I don't know. Addiction is just such a. It, we don't really even know what it is. Yeah. So, so I don't know. But, um... and, and the other thing that I, I made a, like a quite a big life change after Peru, because I realized I didn't want to spend so much time at my laptop. And this has all led me to, you know, you know, training to be a yoga teacher to uh, taking this trip around the world. So like, it's had a quite a profound effect on my life. And I wouldn't say it's a bad one. It, uh, objectively, um, sorry, subjectively. <laughs> you can you can judge. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you would would you say that I was would you do it again would you recommend it I don't think I'd do it again um but it has had a profound effect on my life I think that's in a way because if you go to all that trouble of spending the money and putting yourself through the physical discomfort and and psychological discomfort of going through that some, something then you like it's human nature to want to make it into something like you were saying make it into something positive because otherwise it's just like a 
a not very nice experience you had. But um, that feeling that everything is meaningless and the feeling of like emptiness, I feel like the reason I had that experience is basically because I already had those ideas in my head and yet I hadn't sort of put them all together in in the way that I did when when I was high. So it's kind of like you were saying, you know things, but you haven't really experienced them. And I think experiencing that sense of meaninglessness and emptinessness really made me feel like that is the truth of the universe. And I started getting into reading um, existential philosophers mm. again, because that's this is the existential attitude. Is that That's what they describe it as. It's disorientation, confusion or dread in the meaningless world. And the existentialists have an answer to this, which is to create meaning and commit to it wholeheartedly. So that's kind of empowering. Also, describing this experience to people, a lot of people have said this sounds very similar to the insights that Buddhists come up with. And again, I've studied Buddhist philosophy. I meditate. I know that stuff. So that's unsurprising that that would come up in my head. So I I feel like the thing, the like the sort of the thing that I've come away with that's really important to me is to resist the urge to try and to try and like invent stuff to fill the bowl, and instead just celebrate the fact that this strange world we have where we humans get to decide what it means and there's something really beautiful in that and to recognize that yearning for meaning and see that as a beautiful human thing instead of as something that needs to be satisfied by imagining another world because I think imagining another world devalues the world we live in and yeah and I've been kind of thinking about how to how to keep this fresh Mm. Because I don't want it to like dissolve away because there is something it's helped me with my anxiety. Like, because whenever I feel anxious, I can just do that mental trick that I described of being like, anxiety is just sorrow and sorrow is stupid because everything's meaningless. So that's that that genuinely has helped. Um, I know I'm sounding like a terrible hippie, and I'm only gonna sound more like a hippie when I tell you that I'm kind of starting my own religion. <laughs> just for me, just a personal religion. Although if you want to join, I might consider it. It's focused around the bowl. <laughs> Um, so, so every morning I meditate anyway, my normal practice is to meditate, but I've added in five minutes of staring into the plastic bowl at the end of every meditation. <laughs> and the idea is just to, to try and connect with that yearning and to connect with that feeling of like the absurdity of life. Mm-hmm. So what I do is I'm, I'm kneeling cause I'm meditating anyway. And I put the bowl in front of me and after I finish my 20 minutes of meditation, I open my eyes and I look into the bowl for five minutes and then I sort of kneel down. Um, so it's like a, um, a child's pose with your arms out in front so that my face goes into the bowl. And then I just let out a big sigh, like, oh, like, oh, sure, 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 sure. This is all meaningless. <laughs> and then because I don't want to like get too hoity-toity and, you know, profound about it all, I like to just put the bowl on my head like a hat and grin at how ridiculous humanity is and how ridiculous I am and how ridiculous this whole world is. And then I can get about and go about my day. And that's my new religious ritual. And if that isn't a good enough reason to do ayahuasca, I don't know what is. Oh, I'm kind of embarrassed that I've shared this with all the (laughs) listeners. You have to understand that this is done with awareness that it is ironic and bizarre. (laughs) (laughs) So... Thank you for listening. If you do give it a try, then please check out the show notes where we'll put those notes about safety stuff Mm. so that you can make sure that you're safe. And um, cheers. Have fun out there, psychonauts. (laughs) Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Let us know with a tweet or an email. We'd really love to hear about your experiences. Yes, please tell us what we got wrong. You can email us at hello at seekerandskeptic.com and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at seekerskeptic. You'll find the show notes for this and every episode at seekerandskeptic.com. And if you're interested, you can find my skeptically themed comics at rebeccaonpaper.com or follow me on Twitter at rebeccaonpaper. And I'm at yoga underscore astrology on Twitter. And you can find me exploring the intersection of yoga and astrology at yogaandastrology.com. If you liked what you heard and fancy supporting the show and spreading the word, we'd really appreciate a rating and review in the Apple Podcast Store or wherever you're listening. Or just tell somebody you know about the show. Thanks for listening.
like the dust that high oh, no. uh, I drink a drink and I'm in my demise Poking left me and my homie floating in the sky Jungle vines in my tea, got a brother flying Probably seen a flying manatee in my subtle mind Hubble telescope, couldn't tell me what I saw Slipped out of the devil's claws, right into the realm of God Realized my every flaw, left my ego in the dark No, it wasn't part, just some tree bark in a park now I'm bending words, guess the homie gifted Bent, bend the reality, paradigm shifting Palms itching in my palm, there's a golden ticket Swear this train of thought, the land of me and the land of wisdom Panoramic view, sip the brew, I'm seeing birds Swerved on the LSD, consumed the shrooms and healed the herbs Submerged in the earth, my ego died, me and my homie merged Run with all, observed you with my two, saw through you with my third Energy flowing through my heart again. I'm the shit, I'ma know it all, and that's all it is. Part in my French no homage to the politics or the partisans. Everything they promote is partisan. But I ain't pointing fingers, no poisoning people. With my message, mainstream media is full of evil. And I'm positive the powers that we're bowing down to was the same party ruling in the mid evils. Got the whole world confused up. Understood the world with that occasion confusion. Occasionally an Asian when I'm blazing on that boot up. Lighting up the dark like I'm part of that Ku Klux. Take a stand in a world with no leaders. When no one buy your CD, lets you plan to please the people. In a world where all the needy still believe that they don't need you. Turn to coke, just to coke. Soaking liquor, leaning needles. And I'm speaking to the sheep who ride a plane up on the easel. Speaking of the devil, we gon' overthrow the evil. Government was made by people to serve that people. And if you ain't serving the people, then we gon' need that repeal. Or GMOs finna roam in that food chart. Swear the dude got way too smart off a root block. Who thought? I see through the hoopla, these fools talk. Black thoughts telling white lies like they true chalk Tupac, continue the legacy Got the juice flowing through my veins mixed with Hennessy On another plane, ain't even playing Don't plan to make enemies Transcend the lanes filled with drama and that jealousy Prana in my tenants, solving problems is my tendency Tired of deception and I probably got the remedy Lend a hand to whoever needed, I'm a centipede Money smelling evil, just don't ever get that said to me Check that out, you're watching out my eyes Seeing proper, I ain't just your average rapper Got a line and balance I was the awakening and dropping in this as your mommy Papa with me, fade you from your heart That's all that's it, and you're coping And be smart, I see oxen selling souls at the auction Feeding into lies, your mind is getting boxed in Hiding from the truth, got your head down Ostrich, wisdom from the youth that ain't seen round often Proceed with caution, this could change your life forever Got a dream, overthrow the kings, Martin and Coretta This a cold world with your glove at, in this weather better yet Give you raw meat, that's that salmonella, aloe vera Soothing the nation until so this tragic era has to clear up forever Shepherds, we are the cattle bearers Grab umbrellas, it's raining terror But fella, keep your head up Glad I'm here to pick up the pieces Like it's a shadow mirror, magic mirror Tell me who's the master of my life You reply with it is I, damn Who knew I was domineering And all I'm saying, we can be the change we praying for Soon as you wake up, realize you don't want pain no more Soon as you take up responsibility We'll achieve peace, freedom, and vitality You can kill the beat